Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of the Jams D Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, and today, this is the first B-sides that we are doing of the year 2021, and what better way to kick off the year with uh, an artist like Laura Marling, which you uh, are the expert on, Sersha. We have decided to, we decided to do this just as a... Uh, mostly at the recommendation of her. So why don't you tell us a little bit about one list, Miss Laura Marling, who appeared on um, your best albums of the year list last year for her 2020 album, Song for Our Daughter. Yeah, well, Song for Our Daughter came out before we w- did this thing that we do. Um, so we didn't have a chance to review it. Um, this really thing excited. of ours, this thing <laughs> of ours. <laughs> that thing that you do. The best film, it's not, I'm going to move on. I was about to say my favorite Tom Hanks film. (laughs) Didn't he direct that movie? I think he did. I believe he did. I believe he did. Yeah. Anyway, um, (laughs) Laura Marling, uh, classic uh, Camden folk artist, uh, came out of the, what I refer to as sort of the the Nambuka scene that was happening in the early to mid 2000s in Camden. There was a bar called the Nambuka that gets referenced in a Frank Turner song. Because he played there a lot. Um, tonight I'm playing another Nambu, a show. Um, and lots and lots of folk artists are now quite big. Came out of that, played a lot of gigs at that one bar at about the same time. So you're talking about Laura Marling, Frank Turner, uh, Mumford and Sons, and Nora and the Whale, who Laura Marling was in for two years, uh, from 2006 to 2008. Um, and her first record, uh, Alas, I Cannot Swim, was produced by Charlie Fink. What of Nora and the Whale? Um, Mum, uh, Marcus Mumford of Mumford and Sons contributes backup vocals on Alas I Cannot Swim as well. Um, if you watch the music video for Cross Your Fingers, he is in it. Um, so everyone was there kind of being a bit incestuous all at the same time. Uh, one of the artists in that scene is a guy called Beans on Toast. He wrote the song called I Fancy Laura Marling, <laughs> written Don't when she all. was 16. Okay, never mind. <laughs> There's a line about... Clearly, I spoke too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you speak because you can. Anyway, um, like the album. Um, but when she was 16, that would have been 2006 when she was in Nora and the Whale doing that thing. Um, there's a line in that song about her doing a GCSEs, Jesus Christ. Um, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, I got into Laura Marling because a uh, friend of some of us, I think. Millie? Um, Millie got me into them. Mm. Yeah. Um, Shout out to Millie, who might actually listen to this. She almost so. definitely will. I hope that we do Millie proud. Yes. Yeah, yes. so do I. Um, I've been going back and forth with her a lot in preparation for this episode. Um, yeah, but no, uh, she built up a career leading up to her first record, uh, with a series of singles and EPs, uh, with a few songs that eventually ended up on Unless I Cannot Swim. But uh, the biggest hit of those EPs, a song called New Romantic, didn't actually end up on it, even though she played it on TV, promoted the album with it. Um, it's one of my favorite Laura Marling songs. I think it's beautiful and you should check it out. Um, she is a folk artist, um, occasionally kind of folk rock, alt rock, depending on which album you're listening to. Um, and I think she has a really interesting career progression that I can't wait to uh, get into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. On, on the opposite side of the thing, I um, I had only heard one Laura Mara, Laura Mara, Laura, Mara. <laughs> Laura Marling album, um, which was 2020's release, uh, like a couple months ago. So basically, for this B sides, I was delving into an artist catalog that I had next to no familiarity with. So I went into this basically blind. Yeah. So that was an interesting experience I had. Yeah, um, Song for Our Daughter was also my first uh, Laura Marling record, but I shortly thereafter listened to Alas, I Cannot Swim. Uh, and, I'm, and I have to say, I would, I was, my first reactions to both of those records were kind of middling, but I was very curious to see how she would get from one point to the other, considering the, the polar extremes of her discography. Oh, yeah. And, and I will say ahead of, ahead of this, 
breakdown we're about to do. Um, it was quite an eye-opening experience and both records are heavily recontextualized for me, uh, understanding the full scope of the discography. But on that note, I think, uh, Sergio, you basically led us right to the front doorstep of LP1 nicely. So we should kick into that. Our first record, 2008's Alas, I Cannot Swim. Thank you. Um, I think some of the more iconically Laura tracks um, don't really represent her first album in particular. Um, after this, you get quite a big shift to, uh, towards more cryptic and mystic lyricism. Um, and introductions of more uh, Eastern instruments like the sitar and the mandolin um, to create soundscapes more than folk songs particularly. Um, but on this one, what you have is a collection of 10 or so really nice, very accessible folk pop songs. Um, the opening track, Ghost, best captures not only the, the uh, thematic core, but the general style of the record in terms of how it fits into Laura's career. Um, tells um, a familiar story in love songs. You, you have a damaged man with plenty of lost love in his back catalogue. He puts all of, his, all of his hope into a new relationship. Laura takes the perspective of the person into which all of this hope is put, um, which is, for me at least, a fresh perspective in songs like this. Um, uh, Laura talks about the man performing respectful gestures towards her um, but she is scared by the uh, intensity of emotion that he brings to the relationship. Um, you see him uh, saying that they were ne inevitably meant to wind up together, that, they would, uh, that they'd been following each other, almost drawn together by gravity. Uh, this is a familiar story, and one that is constantly romanticized when it is told from the male perspective. Uh, but Laura balks at this repeating as the song swells and builds that she does not believe in everlasting love and she is not ready to give what he needs out of their relationship. In this way, Ghosts empathetically and melodically not only introduces a trend in Laura's music of undermining typical images in male ideas of romance, but also the traditional image of the brooding man, um, alone with his thoughts, and shows it uh, almost as a shallow pretense at points. Not that that is, a shallow pretense, but many men use it as such. The a, song a recurring also... theme throughout Laura's entire career is she really likes to do that and she is really good at it. Yeah, for real. Um, uh, and what everything you just said makes me think, um, of course, of that uh, there's an iconic line um, on New Romantic, of course, I'll never love a man because love and pain go hand in hand. And that's basically... Yeah. And that song I, I see, I guess, is a mission statement or like a summary of, of where Laura's at mentally at this point in her life. And obviously um, a sort of a feeling and an emotional state and a perspective on relationships that will become more complicated and, and layered as, her, as she gets older, basically. I agree completely. That's a good like, way to assess it as there's an... A, a really interesting dynamic that she develops over the course of her discography of like, I always found that she sort of like, it was weird how when she was younger, at least, she seemed to be way more of a cynic, way more bitter, yeah. way more like just sort of distance from the idea of romance as a whole. And you sort of when you listen to these in order, you see her sort of slowly grow into a more like, vulnerable but simultaneously like more well-rounded person who's able yeah. to treat the issue with a bit more nuance and that progression is like really satisfying to see over yeah her. i completely agree it's not that she like loses her cynicism um it's just that she it, it, it just her whole emotional perspective gets more complex as as she gets older and i guess that's a sort of an act accurate uh, reflection of of <laughs> what it is like, you know, getting older and, and aging through your twenties. Uh, I'm 23, so I'm still kind of like I probably can't claim to have had the same, you know, experiences that Laura's had. Um, but I feel a, a kinship with her progression through and maturing through um, relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, part of why I really like this album, and I really like Song for a Daughter, um, which, you know, I'll talk about this progression more as we go, is that one is like a great record written by a very young person. 
um, and a song for our daughter feels like a really great record written by a much older person looking at the record in a more mature way. And I think both of those perspectives are very artistically interesting to yeah. me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I also think Ghost sets a wonderful aesthetic trend for the record. Um, it is much more stripped back compared to the rest of Laura's discography. There's much more almost like poppy chord progressions, but uh, taken in very complicated ways. Um, this leads us on to Old Stone, which itself at points plays like a more traditional Laura song in that it is more complicated, more brooding and more cryptic. Um, it again, it kind of ridicules the idea of uh, this very serious man chasing Laura and calling it a childish game. Uh, saying that he loves it that way, or loves her that way, and paints a picture of this older man as the old stone who can only imagine her as something to be captured, not a full human, or even someone who is, uh, even, I think of the man more as someone who is maybe more older spirit could match, I imagine. But Laura admits that her self-destructive nature is drawing her into this no good, bad idea relationship. Uh, the song's brooding nature is something that Laura will develop on more as her career goes on. He taps on my window is a nuanced and beautifully orchestrated picture of such a potential, potentially toxic relationship. As he taps at her window, constantly bothering her, she will not have him treat her this way, which is a quote from the song. Um, Failure is one of my favorite Laura Marling songs. It's a beautiful song with a lilting, classically Nambuka folk flow. Um, about an artist who used to charm Laura with his guitar, something I have done and have had done to me. <laughs> Experiencing a hardship uh, that she has an inside view to for the first time, um, almost as if before, when you are charmed by someone's artistic skill, you see them as this idealized person. And then when you realize that they are a flawed human because now you're inside their life, it, it recontextualizes how you think about the art almost. Um, although Laura repeats, don't cry child, you've got so much more to live for. You've got something I would die for. And if it comes to the rain, just be glad you'll smile again because so many don't. So many go unnamed. Um, and I break into Ow. tears every time I hear that. <laughs> Ow. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it's perhaps an obvious comparison, um, but that song in particular, which I agree is is one of the standouts on this record, uh, the way that she kind of approaches that theme, and also just the way that the song sounds, uh, reminded me quite a bit of Fiona Apple, um, yes. in particular. Um, yeah, uh, I just I definitely got that vibe from that song, and I'll touch on that a little bit more when I review mm. it. I mean, some of the songs on her next couple of albums reminded me particularly of uh, Fetch the Bolt Cutters in the way in which they are sort of constantly changing and shifting. Um, totally. But I suppose we'll talk more about that when I get there. Um, yeah, this is a song that in the past has gotten me through some quite horrible times. Like, sometimes when you have a song that is literally telling you, free of subtext, that it is going to be okay eventually, that's a perfectly fine thing to do. The, the Robin Williams and Goodwill hunting approach, as it were. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next song is You All Know God, the chorus of which uh, breaks into beautiful harmonies um, when the music keeps you guessing as Laura runs up and down scales in ways that remind me of Fiona Apple. Um, she keeps breaking up the song into new parts and elements. Um, Cross Your Fingers and the interlude Crawl Out of the Sea. Um, I presented as one whole song in the music video. Um, that's how I discovered them. It's how I think about them. So I'm going to talk about them as one song. Um, again, Laura takes a more critical look at practices normally romanticized by male writers in the way uh, that this man gives all of himself. It is, it is more than Laura is capable of taking. Um, and it leaves him bigger and stronger, but less alive, less of himself, because he has given so much of himself away to someone who can't hold it. Um, this is where the production of Charlie Fink, What of Noah and the Whale, is most apparent. Uh, this duo song thing is probably the most apparently Noah and the Whale sounding song on the record. Um, people at home, they were pretty big in England. Uh, they did a song called Five Years Time that's really famous. Um, where was I? Um, yeah, Crawled Out of the Sea adds to the narrative, providing another side similar to Ghosts in which you have 
what is apparently a swamp creature crawling out of the sea into a welcome embrace, showing both sides of this relationship and their needs and what they're getting out of it makes this story one of the most nuanced pictures of a relationship like this on the record for me. Um, both halves build and build until they stop flowing into each other. Um, Crawled Out of the Sea specifically is such a beautiful flow, breaking into um, a really uh, aesthetically pleasing trumpet. Um, my Manic and I uh, betrays a toxic relationship in an interesting way. I just want to say, I do not take this song literally. I do not think Laura is denigrating having manic depression on this song. Um, oh, oh, I have plenty to say about that song, and it, that, that to suggest that would be foolish, I think. 100%. I mean, it's not literal. It, it's more about... Um, <laughs> The way in which this this man is like internalized his trauma and rage to to the point where he is incapable of really engaging with Laura as a person. I have known many men like this in my life. I have lived with a few. Um, I feel like these elements are the are the, are the gods that Laura doesn't believe, and that you know it's, it's like the meme of like men will just like punch walls instead of getting therapy. That's what the song is. Um, um, it is aided by uh, a brooding, mysterious acoustic backing with pianos and drums adding to its eerie sense. Um, at the end, um, amongst birdsong, they reunite, continuing in their torturous dance, aided by Laura changing the pronouns from he to we. Um, Night Terror seems to be the flip side of the story. When her man is genuinely troubled, she runs to Shepherd's Bush Green, which I have been to out of fear. I, I, I love it in British folk songs where they reference places I've been. It just, it makes me feel so like at home um, in this setting. Um, it also like the tone of the song, the reference to like recognizable British greenery reminds me of like folk horror, like a field in England. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's got a slow, almost like madrigal type uh, feeling to it. Um, but even though she runs from his troubles out of fear, she also wants to defend him, shouting to the demons, if they want him, they're going to have to fight me. Um, I love the like country influences the song has, melding it with very traditional folk. Um, the, um, it's, sorry, um, and I love the country influences specifically on, and the bucking chorus on the captain and the hourglass, um, even if the rest of the song, yeah. Uh, Shine is just beautiful to me. Soft and bare production, immaculate lyrics about a crumbling relationship. She repeats over and over again that she needs Shine and almost like the cryptic puzzle of the relationship is I'm picking this metaphor. Um, and I, it just kind of refers to, to peace you know, um, she's in this relationship that used to be really great and they used to share a lot. Um, but now they're in a place where at the beginning, it's like she wants to return to those like salad days of the relationship. But by the end, you kind of realize that what she wants is to be free um, and independent, I suppose. Um, yeah, she realizes that she must leave behind what once made her so happy. Um, she is reborn, reformed and forgiven, to quote the song again. Uh, Dora is a beautiful closer with wonderful sound effects and production around it. But the real joy for me is the title track, which is a hidden track um, in this song. Um, it feels like a classic folk song, verging almost on a sea shanty. Um, this feels like a song that, that could be generational, like passed down generation to generation. It evokes Gatsby in the, proje the projection of desires across water. Um, it's a lyrical epitome of the grass is always greener. So what we see here is a collection both of, very, of uh, really real traditional folk influences and a real pop sensibility and a fresh perspective on relationships in music that I almost never see. Um, sort of reappropriating what has traditionally been, uh, sort of reappropriating archetypes that have traditionally been the ground of, of, of uh, male writers, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I fucking love this album. I dig it. It's a bunch of fun even if it's not very representative of the rest of her career. It's a great debut record. It's a great statement of intent. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that, um, you know, the interesting thing about this is that, like, 
like Tyler knows this because I, I voiced my concern, I think as soon as yesterday where I was just like, <laughs> I, like, I, I just, I haven't found like the, the narrative or, or sort of resonance with Laura Marling that I needed to like find to identify mm -hmm. with an artist that I love. And mm -hmm. then what happened curiously was I went and re-listened to all her albums last night, but I did it in order. Uh, instead mm -hmm. of just like, like before I just kind of did it scattershot because I mean, I listened to song for her daughter. So I was like, okay, I'll just do this in whatever order strikes my fancy. But then I did that. And my opinion went like topsy turvy on how I felt about maybe half of these. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that said, uh, this is the only one for me that didn't change at all because I, I think it's great. I think this album's fantastic. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear her like again, coming off of the song for daughter, it's like you're hearing her with a much more youthful, sort of passionate spirit. Uh, you can hear her accent a little bit more in uh, her vocal performances, which um, uh, after listening to, I think three records before this, I did not know she was British. <laughs> then I listened to this and was like, oh, <laughs> okay, whoosh. That is, that, I think uh, that's so funny to me that you didn't know she was British <laughs> after listening to even one of her records. Right? Like, <laughs> I go back and I hear it now, and then before I'm just like, what the fuck? Um, but I love that it, like, it gives her, it, it sort of adds to that youthfulness that, that I find on this album. And um, uh, personally, like, it's not as much as in, like, contextually speaking, it definitely, like you said, doesn't lean into the more allegorical, mythology-heavy, like, lyrics and sort of maybe more of the esotericism that she's more inclined to explore in. But I think that's actually still found here, but more so with the sound than it is the lyrical content. Because there are so many moments on here where I was just kind of like, this sounds so mystical. It, it, it's a very strange breed of folk that's, like, pulling for lots of different things, and it just makes me go like, this was a fucking debut? I mean... She, she obviously had EPs before this, but it's just so startling to see how confident she was uh, going off the bat. Um, but uh, record starts out with Ghosts. Um, I, I think the, like, the weepy sort of violins and the sort of metaphor comparing past lovers to, to ghosts, uh, it's an apt comparison. Shows how she's become a bit jaded in her youth, saying that she doesn't believe in everlasting love. Like, whoever she's currently involved with is going to become one of the titular ghosts one day. Um, and there's Old Stone. I love the fucking vocal hooks. The Honey, I Was Never Gonna Change. Honey, You Were Never Gonna Change. Uh, sort of just a song about the wild, fickle nature of love and how it can hurt us, propel us back and forth, or hold us back. Uh, one thing that I think she is consistently great at across her entire discography is um, song structure. The way instrumentals build in all of her, just her entire career, is like nothing short of expert. She knows how to pace a song in and of itself so fucking perfectly. And that's just, it's, again, it's right out of the bat. She just started doing it like she had been her entire life. Um, uh, and I also just like songs like Old Stone because it does contribute to that narrative we talked about, to sort of the, uh, the, the, the layers it has to it on other records. It makes this more contextually interesting. Um, Tap at My Window, um, miraculously not one of my top three favorite songs on this album, but yet still I think it's fucking amazing. I think it might right. even be in my top ten of her overall. Um, but it's, you know, it tells that story of a failure to connect emotionally with a partner uh, and the environment uh, one grows up in and how it fosters your emotional dependency on others. Uh, there's these gorgeous violins that coat these lyrics of, they're full of bitterness and regret. And all of this just sort of feeds into whether or not she wants to let people in. Uh, there's an instrumental explosion, well, by, you know, her standards, uh, <laughs> right. really satisfying. Um, uh, Failure uh, is one of Laura's songs where I sort of read, sh she does this a lot, uh, but I read this song as something where she frames talking to a version of her past self from her current self, sort of giving them advice specifically around love 
and remaining uh, healthy emotionally speaking. Lots of bittersweet lyrics here show these versions of herself and what has changed between them, and it's a really great lyrical dynamic, uh, and it's reprised amazingly on some other records. Uh, You're No God is sort of Laura reminding herself, and even like humanity as a whole of their place, really, and just how they should embrace humility and sort of grow from that. Uh, and specifically when it comes to the world of men, I think. Uh, Cross Your Fingers, fantastic song. Uh, it's sonically pleasant, but it contrasts with almost comedic levels of darkness as she details this codependent relationship using metaphors like jumping into graves, uh, for the other person to be reborn or both dying in a building collapsing uh, to mm -hmm. showcase the complexities of how relationships uh and c collapse and just how they can yield consequences you didn't expect yeah and, uh, and the way that like when she's saying like jump into your grave and die and the strings are just going like that yeah and you're just like, like yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait a minute um and i i find her interesting on crawled out of the sea uh uh I find that perspective interesting because that's like a one part of the album that didn't have me as much as the other. I didn't know that it was sort of a, a an interlinked sort of situation, but now I'm anxious to go back and revisit it with that newfound context. I just didn't think that the interlude itself um, added, like, I guess without the context of the other song, it just sort of feels aimless. But now that I know it's really just supposed to be one thing, like in the music video, that's going to change how I feel about that. Um, but then you go into My Manic and I, uh, which is fucking great. Uh, it's a song that combines two very, very poignant subject matters uh, that I am keenly familiar with. It's a song about feeling mania and her urgent and increasingly quick sort of descending vocals reflect this. Uh, it's more through the lens of how her mania affects other people rather than herself. Uh, even though it's not devoid of personal insight. Uh, it's kind of an empathic song that's trying to understand how it affects those around you and why it might be difficult. And then, expertly, the story expands further, um, showing it how it affects someone she's romantically involved with and how she wants to give them the benefit of doubt when they're still mistreating her while she's undergoing this sort of manic phase, uh, which is an insanely cathartically relatable song uh, sort of learning to about learning to draw a line between your own emotional volatility and being self-aware and just like letting people walk all over you, which is um, it's really relatable. Laura, thank you for that. It had me feeling some feelings <laughs> in work yesterday. Um, but okay. I, I love that approach. I think it's a geniusly written song, and uh, I connect with it very much. Um, I love the folky, almost medieval sounding instrumental build on Night Terror that climaxes in the song's final third, just gorgeous stuff combined with her great performance. Uh, the Captain and the Hourglass is one of my favorites on here. It's like a remarkably brisk ballad that feels, uh, I don't know how to describe this in, like, I, I just know I can assign this adjective to something when I hear it, and that's iconic. I just hear the song and I'm just like, this is what this song feels like. It feels so definitive. Um, and uh, it sounds like a song that like a bard would perform while I was like playing Skyrim or something. And it's just one of her <laughs> more vocally nuanced performances that details a, a very heartbreaking story. And I, I just can't get enough of that. It's fucking fantastic. It's storytelling that, you know, I, I wouldn't see um, totally divorced from something like a Tom Waits album, which is not the last time that'll pop up either. Um, Shine picks up uh, comparatively simpler than the last track. It's a somber song about the disconnect between her and someone she cares for, using some occasionally frightening imagery to represent emotional disconnect and how it manifests physically. Uh, that brought about the patient, brought about by the passage of time. Uh, and then the sort of de facto closer, if you don't count the hidden track, uh, is the incredible seven minute long, your only doll, uh, parent, parent, bleh, parentheses, Dora, um, this song begins with like the sound of, of birds chirping and a simple melody that sort of makes it feel like you're listening to a summer morning. Uh, it's a fantastically restrained vocal performance, uh, especially compared to the rest of them on the album. 
And it's about being with a possessive man and how she finds comfort and power in her sexuality and the disparity between that and who she is as a person, uh, hinting that this is something she's been sort of molded into and how she wants to break away from that. Um, the piano comes along and makes this song like sparkle uh, with some ensuing vocal harmonies. And she describes herself as being a, a broken doll, someone who refuses to be alive, saying she cannot swim, but regrets not jumping in the river to end her own life. And there's a beautiful moment midway through the song where everything just stops. And it's nothing but that ambience you heard at the beginning. And it's wonderful. Uh, and then the song structure changes up a bit here, and it becomes a bit more folk-oriented, and she talks about dreaming of a different life of possibilities. Uh, it's a heartbreaking ending to the song where she tries to find solace in uh, hard work and earning money through the metaphor of gold, saying she'd uh, be held up by a golden gun. And it's just sort of, a again, a tragic story of, of dependency in a way, and like trying to find solace in it, even though it's basically hopeless. And... Uh, yeah, I, I just think this is a fucking excellent debut. I think it's lyrically incredibly strong. It definitely is a weird outlier in her discography, but I think that really just adds to its appeal of just like, I'm glad that this album exists because it's exploring a facet of her sound that uh, is not found elsewhere. And I uh, I don't know, I really love it. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's way more emotionally direct, which I really value. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, <laughs> when we it's recently we recently reviewed Taylor Swift, uh, and in that review, I think I remember saying that um, could, that because those Taylor Swift's most recent records, not drawing a comparison between her and Laura Marling, I just trying to make a point. Um, her most recent records attempted to go in a more sort of singer songwriter direction with more kind of folk influenced instrumentals. And I remember remarking uh, to myself that Taylor was the, 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 the folk singer songwriter image was a good fit for Taylor, but that she as a songwriter was the weakest thing about her songs. Mm -hmm. The instrumentals were just so much more compelling than she was as an artist. And when I listen to a record like Alas, I Cannot Swim, uh, I find that uh, in this particular record, Laura is so much more compelling than not everything that's going on instrumentally, but with the context of where she would go as a performer and as a, an orchestrator of music, uh, I, I do find this one of the less interesting records of hers musically, although I do appreciate its directness. Um, the songwriting here is stellar, and I, I really don't have uh, much more to add that hasn't already been said with regard to what these songs are about and how affecting they are. Uh, I actually really appreciate some of the lacerating cynicism that is present here that's been touched on. Um, I, I find in particular, um, Jake, you just touched on the closing track, which I think is probably my favorite song here, both, the, both parts of it, including the um, bonus track. There's a there's a kind of uh, almost a sarcastic cynicism and sadness to it that I think is really kind of lacerating. Uh, and and a lot of the other um, songs on this record that I think are highlights are imbued with a similar sense of kind of either being sung with a smirk or with a sense of uh, ebullience um lashing out basically and, and 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 you definitely feel laura's youth in this record and it gives it so much of the character that makes it so compelling um uh, ghost is a really great song as well I, I enjoy it has a gently thrumming pulse and a really strong vocal presence from laura um she shows her skill for writing strong hooks uh, and the way that her band picks up around her to the swelling finish is a really nice development um, um, I've already touched on the way that failure evokes Fiona Apple, uh, both in Laura's vocal tone and in the subject matter, though I think it has to be said that Laura lacks her dynamism and rawness, but that's not necessarily a flaw. Uh, Laura's specialty is subtlety, and there is an intricacy to the arrangements and the way that she weaves around them. 
that's very skillful, uh, especially considering that she was only 18, I believe, when this record came out. Sweet Jesus. Um, uh, I think the record does, uh, in terms of consistency, the record does pick up a bit more in the back half. I think uh, the three-track run of My Mannequin Eye, Night Terror, and Captain the Hourglass in particular stands out as a um, consecutive stretch of greatness on this record. Uh, Mannequin Eye being probably the best of the three for reasons that have already been touched on. It has a jaunty folk strut that I love and also vague shanty vibes that recall early Decemberists <laughs> records. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I really admire Laura's talent for painting these really uh, gripping character studies. Um, and I like the way that you can, with a track like My Manic and I, there's a sense of dual interpretations. You can interpret it as be interpretate you can interpret it <laughs> as being a literal literally about this um, toxic relationship between two people or you can interpret it on a more abstract level as being about um laura's relationship with her own sadness or with her own uh mania um yeah and i, I think that she gets that across uh without you know pointing you directly to it um uh, which is great. Um, I love the delightfully layered and intricate mix on Captain and the Hourglass. Uh, I enjoy the way that Laura's vocals are double tracked and that points soar on this track. Um, and yeah, just generally speaking, uh, even though it's more of a comparative thing, I think uh, the first time I heard this, I kind of I kind of wasn't really super into it and I didn't really kind of understand Laura as a songwriter, but I enjoyed what was going on musically. And then when I revisited it <laughs> after hearing all her records, I was like disengaged from some of the stuff that was happening musically, but I was more appreciating what Laura was doing. Um, and so I think it's a really decent, uh, strong starting point with some definite highlights. Um, I mean, as far as debut records go, uh, you can't, you can't really fault Laura for much of this at all. I think it's really good stuff, um, uh, but it's certainly not one that I'll reach to put on uh, as frequently as some of the other ones that we'll talk about today. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if there's nothing else to add. Let's do favorite tracks and ratings. Yes, let's do it. Um, uh, Sersha, why don't you go first? Okay, so my favorite tracks uh are probably got i put like favorite track marks next to so many of them uh, so i'm gonna just plump for ghost old stone and failure if i had to pick a least favorite track and i don't want to um i might go for um the interlude even though it's part of a bigger song but by itself it's a bit insubstantial um, and I'm going to give this record a 9.5 out of 10. Beautiful. Jake. Uh, my three favorite tracks. I love how you mentioned the specifically, Tyler, the three track run uh, near the end of the album being like a really high point because those are my three favorite songs. They are My Manic and I. Um, actually, no, wait, no, I forgot. Night Terror is in between it. Whoopsie. Um, but it, the, my three favorite songs are My Manic and I, The Captain, The Hourglass, and Your Only Doll, Dora. Uh, my least favorite is also The Interlude, and I give this an 8 out of 10. Great. Uh, my three favorite tracks are uh, Ghosts, My Manic and I, and Your Only Doll. Uh, my least favorite track, probably uh, Shine, I guess. Uh, and I'm going to give this record an emphatic 6.5. Okay, um, so that gives it on average an, an eight, exactly, Ooh. which puts it among the likes of No Dream and Glacier Flower Twenty. Damn! All right, let's go. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, excellent. All right, so okay. Laura keeps up her. Laura's pretty consistently, um, you know, she doesn't take any long, hasn't had any long gaps in her career, so. For her sophomore effort, we move uh, reasonably quickly onward to 2010. Album number two, which is called I Speak Because I Can. Um, this is the beginning of Laura heading into like the hinterland of experimentation in many ways. 
Um, like when you open your second record with a song like Devil Spoke, you oh, are making fuck an an- yeah. I know. You're making an announcement about where you're taking your sound f- f- for the future. Because uh, that is a song that, that is cryptic, that, that is creepy, that is eerie, um, and, and aggressive. Oh, yeah. um, with imagery of Laura uh, taking on the devil. In, um, and you believe like, she could. Exactly. Um, she says, take the devil's spy your spoke and spin him to the ground. And you identify with the devil in this situation. <laughs> Because you like, two are, are feeling spun to the ground in this situation. Spin me into the ground, queen. Like, literally, it feels like you have gone on, like, someone has put a wheel in between you and Laura, and you've each, like, gripped a side of it, and you look each other in the eyes, like, are we doing this? And Laura's like, we're doing this. And then you go, and you're just stuck in this, like, merry-go-round from hell as this song, like, drags you and drags you. I'm imagining it as the torture device from the Princess Bride. <laughs> <laughs> Less water. The pits of despair. <laughs> the pit of despair. Um, anyway, Princess Bride, good film. Uh, <laughs> That doesn't mean that there aren't um, like softer moments on this record. Um, like one of the most famous Laura Marling songs is uh, "What He Wrote." Um, it's got really, f- got really famous because it was used in an Peaky iconic, Blinders. yeah, iconic Peaky Blinders scene where Killian That's Murphy is buried alive. Um, <laughs> she also covers Nick Cave's "Red Right Hand" for that show. Um, well, I know the title scene's the original version, the title song. Does she? For Peaky well, then that's her. Baboom. Oh. Baboo. Okay. Yeah, that was the first Nick Cave song I ever heard. It's, it's a good one. Um, anyway, yeah. But uh, that's a really um, very soft and very lilting song that, again, invokes uh, people like, like Hera, you know, like Greek mythology is brought in mm-hmm. to aid the complexity of this song. Um, and I think this song is like the best meeting between what she would do for like the, this and about two, three albums after this. You and said And the it. last one. Yep, that's, I, I was going to make that point. Perfectly well, perfectly illustrated there. Thank you. But it's like you have that cryptic shit, um, but also the songs are so catchy and so exciting. Um, like something like uh, Blackberry Stone, which I said earlier makes me feel like the, the eulogy scene in Guardians 2, um, in that it feels like it's eulogizing a very complicated person, both with love and with all of the complexity they lived with. Um, mm, definitely, yeah, definitely. God, absolutely. that's a fucking song. Oh, man. Um, and I love it two pieces. <laughs> I, I love Rambling Man as well, which is one of Laura's most famous songs. Um, it's a song that's like simultaneously about resignation and perseverance. Um, if, if Albert Camus said, imagine Sisyphus happy, Laura said, just give me to a rambling man. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but it's like sort of lines like my children will live just to grow old. Like, and it's very dour, very sad. And then it builds and builds and builds to like a joy when it says, just give me to a rambling man. Let it always be known that I was who I am, which is such a beautiful sentiment. Um, Weird about for Laura to cover an Allman Brothers band song. Heyo. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, also love Hope in the Air. There's hope in the water, but not even for me, your last serving daughter, which uh, reminds me of Leah, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. It's very Baroque. It's very cryptic. Um, yeah. Forgive, um, yeah, forgive my, she asks, uh, she says she's going to forgive shortcomings and childish behavior. Um, And it's just a very complicated song um, about 
or feeling like you're on your last legs with someone you love very dearly. Um, I think um, my notes are very hard to read, but I love that song. Um, I also want to highlight while I'm here, um, Goodbye England Covered in Snow. Um, mm. As someone who lives in England, uh, this song captures what it's like to look upon the English countryside or even like London urban areas in that beautiful weather setting and just to, uh, to, to um, be able to absorb in yourself uh, this real like peace. Um, and it starts with that hook and it ends with that hook and everything in between feels like it's teasing you to get back to, to get back to that hook. Um, and then at the end, she said, uh, when I go back to England, all covered with snow, it's just, ah, it's so satisfying mm -hmm. because it starts with peace and then it's disrupted and she brings you back to it by the end. And it's just perfectly yeah. elliptical I... one thing. I've never been to England, but their song still gives me Ma makes chills. me feel like I have been. Yeah, yeah. I, it makes me think of my own England in snow. Like you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's I know. It, it, ah, well said. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, I agree with your analysis. Very uh, well said. Um, Darkness ascends for a title like that is a very fun song. <laughs> Um, Who said Laura Marling doesn't have a sense of humour? <laughs> yeah, um, I have slightly less to say about this record. Um, in part, just because it's harder to decipher. Um, and also it has more songs like uh, Made by Maiden, Alpha Shallows, that I feel very little about. Um, but this, Your if last. you want... Th those I, are I, two I, of my top three. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I, I love I love Alpha Shallows. Alpha Shallows, Shallows. I think Alpha Shallows might be my favorite song on the album. Wow. As a matter of fact. But yeah. Well, Respect. okay. Well, then I will listen to hear what you guys have to say about it, and then try to go back to it with those words in mind. Well, if you are if you're a little disappointed that you don't have as much to say, um, well. Yeah, uh, don't worry. I do I, as well. I, I, I won't <laughs> okay. bury the lead or anything. This is my favorite Laura Marling album. Uh, mm. This uh, it is a lean 38 minutes long and i think it is just simply her best crop of songs um it also just like there is something about this album that makes me feel at home it, it it's comforting even though it's like weird in parts especially with like the opener there is something about it that just, it feels like a blanket it's it's not like like other of her albums just they they, they also do this and i think <laughs> it is in part to the fact that she is branching out with her sound and a lot of influence here is um uh felt at least by me anyway as somebody who grew up where i did is um uh that of bluegrass music uh which just takes me right back to feeling like a child and it just sort of puts me in this really nice head space that i feel like is the ideal way to process this um and you know devil spoke um begins it's like ominously till a very folk americana guitar comes in got these eerie vocal harmonies it's super twangy and energetic and full sounding this record sounds so fucking good um uh an improvement over the last album which i still think sounded good um i yeah the production it's, on this record is so immaculately done yeah, um, it, it's like raucous yeah. and and it's, well, it's just it's both the choices of instrumentation and how everything's mixed together. Yeah. Um perfect in my opinion. Yeah, which is a trend really. Um because I <laughs> really don't really don't think Marla I swear to fucking god, I can't talk. <laughs> Laura never has like a foot uh wrong with, with production really. I think that with, with one exception, I think that she is just kind of knocked it out of the park her entire career. Um, but then we have Made by Maid. Uh, it's a bit of a gentle come down from the last song. It's a lo got a lovely guitar melody. And it's, again, it's that real warm blanket of a song. Um, then there's Ramblin' Man. Uh, after the first verse, the momentum really picks up. It's an optimistic song about pursuing your goals in life without compromising. Uh, the distant vocal harmonies near the final third are just fucking haunting and I, I love them it's a it's a fucking fantastic song 
uh, Blackberry Stone, Laura's voice is a bit gentler as a folky chord progression leads us along with some tasteful violins. I love like the faint shuffling percussion that comes along. And the album is like, again, I just wrote here that it just, it's so well produced. It sounds great. Um, and then there's Alpha Shallows. It has this old school Americana energy about it, but the distant plucking strings make it feel more distinctly modern. Um, and the sparkling harps and pianos just make a great narrative-driven track. I, I love this. Um, Goodbye England, uh, fucking relatable. Like, uh, I tried to be a girl who likes to be used, but there's a mind in this head. And it's like, <laughs> damn, dude, he really, uh, he really hit where it hurts today, I guess. Uh, it's anthemic. It's a barn burner of a folk song. Um, Hope in the Air, um... The dark piano notes in the first third give me chills. Uh, why fear death? Be scared of living. Uh, it's kind of apocalyptic in nature. I love the way that she changes the tone in her vocal delivery here. It reminds me a lot of bluegrass music. Um, what he wrote, uh, recognize that from Peaky Blinders. Uh, it's a very mystical sounding song, sort of building upon what she did in the last record, some of the stuff that I really liked the most. Um, Darkness Descends, uh, it's stylistically kind of all over the place, uh, but it's energetic and held up by strong lyricism. It's my least favorite track on the album by virtue of the fact that something had to be. I still think it's a really good song. Uh, and then uh, I Speak Because I Can, it's a song very specifically about self-expression and the dangers and freedoms of it, especially through art and song. It feels almost like not autobiographical, but like emotionally autobiographical and how this is just sort of like she approaches her artistry, I think, which is also mm -hmm. just a deeply relatable sentiment. And yeah, I think it's it's lean. This is an all killer, no filler album. It's got pretty much everything that I consider to be quintessential uh, Laura. And I, I just I really love it. It's the one I, I keep coming back to. And I, I think it's uh, I think it's fantastic. It's um, mm -hmm. a testament to like if anybody watching this wants to like get into Laura, take my advice here. Live with these for a little bit because I feel like they they need time. Uh, because this was not instantly my favorite. Um, I just sort of like had it in the background. It's like, oh, that that was really good too. And every time I came back to it, I just liked it more. And it's so easy to digest. So yeah, I think this is fucking excellent. Not to say that she goes downhill from here. She does not. Um, but, I mean, in spur, as far as a sophomore slump goes, uh, it ain't. So. Yeah, as, as much as this isn't my favourite Laura Marling record, uh, by a couple of records, um, this is definitely what I'd recommend starting, um, because it's very accessible and representative of most of her body of work. Um, and just a quick note on the title, actually, uh, because I, you were talking about the title track. Um, We've already talked about how much like Laura makes a point of talking about like the feminine perspective in her music. Um, there's a line on the title song on the last album she did, uh, where she addresses her daughter and said, uh, though they may want you to take off your clothes, whatever they think the action yeah. exposed. Um, I feel like this title is probably the most representative of like her artistic purpose in that uh, but Laura is in the landed gentry, gentry, if you didn't know. Um, that's just basically a name for people in England who are like deigned to own land because of their heritage. Um, so like her father was a lord. Um, oh. She is incredibly well off. And I feel like what this title says is like, um, I have been given a platform by my things outside of my control i i am able to say these things when other people maybe don't have the opportunities i've had and therefore it is a responsibility that i must do that yeah i think you yeah. can also that's definitely quite an important thing to acknowledge with regard to that statement but it's also like it's an obvious like spin on the classic descartes aphorism right descartes mm. descartes aphorism i think therefore i am yeah yeah exactly but it's like to me descartes <laughs> it, it's to me it's like it's like a reflection of like what is so special about being human um yeah. the fact that you know we're able to express and comprehend and perceive and understand all of the things that we can 
uh, and and what a and as a result, what a privilege art is, and and what how it's basically kind of the most beautiful thing in the world um, because of how special it is, and because of how special it is that we can do it. Um, but but yeah, anyway, um, yeah, I, I I it's frankly a miracle that this is like that there are multiple Laura Marling records I like more than this because this is a really really great album i think laura's growing confidence is immediately apparent here uh, not that she didn't not that she didn't uh, portray confidence on her <laughs> debut record um but that it was on alas i cannot swim it was like i said it was kind of a ebullient it was kind of like you know speaking loudly to be heard whereas here it's just whereas here laura has a little bit more assuredness a little bit more confidence uh, and as a result her music is more appealing and i think ages better um and and you get as a result of that you get an album that i think is brimming with poise uh, focus and drive uh in every way i think it's an improvement on the first record now though i don't think uh, Laura has fully developed her singular voice in every aspect quite yet on this record. Uh, there are still some moments, I think, like um, the second track that feel comparatively, and Darkness of Scenes, that feel comparatively anonymous and said it. It still has to be said that the swirling and decisive production of a track like Opener Devil Spoke is a very declarative statement of purpose. Uh, we can automatically see that Laura is less concerned with writing poppy hooks than she was on the first record. Um, she takes a gamble on the strength of her writing to carry the record, though she's such a talented singer and writer that much of what she says has its own way of sort of sticking with you um, and calling itself back to memory uh, spontaneously. Um, the most obvious comparison for Laura's sound here, particularly on a track like Rambling Man, is obviously Joan Mitchell, particularly her pre-jazz sort of early era, um, but infused with the modern folk aesthetics of, of Americana and British folk pop bands, and obviously the scene, this very specific scene that Sersh has already alluded to. Uh, although I think that um, the Americana comparison I just made is interesting because I just discovered after writing that an interview where Laura says that Americana is her least favorite type of music, which I think is <laughs> very interesting. Um, interesting. But anyway, yeah, you can definitely hear some of the uh, influence of, um, in certain aspects of bands like Noah and the Whale and Mumford and Sons, bands of whose both front men had amusingly been romantically involved with Laura by the time this record was made, as Sersh has already stated. Uh, as such, coupled with the record's theme of blossoming womanhood and coming to terms with Laura's identity as a woman and within a particular scene and tradition, it's easy to imagine how these things inform Laura's growing focus and drive as a songwriter. Uh, with Blackberry Stone, Laura addresses her relationship with Noah and the Whale frontman Charlie Fink. Uh, or at least that is my understanding of, of who the song's about, obviously that may not necessarily be the specific truth, um, but the string parts here delightfully croon alongside her with a gentle percussive thrum. Uh, all of these elements strangely remind me of The National, funnily enough, particularly their first three early records, which I think are similarly indebted to Americana and have a similar taste for layered production over acoustic driven tracks. Um, nowhere is this more evident than in the swell of alpha shallows and the absolutely brimming with detail mix of the instrumentally manifold hope in the ear with its gently twanging banjo, its emotive piano chords, bassy string swells, and of course, Laura's stirring voice front and center. Um, Goodbye England is an assured album highlight, a career highlight, uh, tying nostalgic love for the nation and snow, to her desire to move forward from a reliance on others and into living her own life. Uh, in many ways, uh, it is perfectly reflective of, I think, how you feel when you're 20 and when you're considering your roots and where you're going and who you want to be. Uh, there are many songs up to this point in Laura's career that I like a lot, but I think that Goodbye England is her first properly great song canon songwriter song. 
according to Laura, what he wrote is inspired by wartime love letters from women left behind. And the song reckons with the emotional turmoil of a racked loneliness, being forced to stay strong and true by virtue of being a woman and nothing else. That's what you're supposed to do. The, and then you have uh, the title track, uh, which I think is among the most explicit on the record with regard to Laura's interest in the roles of men and women in relationships. It's a fantastic capstone to the album. Uh, and I think that it's incredibly moving. Uh, and and I, I think it might even be her best song. I'm not sure if I'm confident enough to say that yet. Um, but it feels really like, again, much like Goodbye England, it feels like an instant canon uh, song. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that, uh, again, while I do think that Laura would go on to do records that floor me more than this one, and that I like the sound of a little bit more than this one, that's not a criticism or a mark down on this at all. It's a really, really good album. It is the absolute inverse of the sophomore slump. It is, it, I think, demonstrates, um, and I think that you would have to be, if you encountered it when it came out, you would have to have a strong confidence that Laura was going to go on to do more great things. Um, and yeah, I really, really dig this album quite a lot. Great. Really glad to hear it. Yeah. Uh, Right, so let's go in reverse jams and see order for this, I think. Sure. Okay, I'll go first. Um, my three favorite tracks on this record are, of course, I Speak Because I Can, uh, Goodbye England, and I'll say Hope in the Air. Uh, least favorite track, if I had to pick one, would probably be Made by Maid. Uh, still a good song. And I'm going to give this album 8 out of 10. Nice. Um... My three favourite songs are probably uh, Rambling Man, Blackberry, Stone, and Goodbye England. Um, again, Maven Maid is probably also my least favourite track. I'm giving this an eight and a half out of ten. My three favourite tracks are Rambling Man, Alpha Shallows, and Hope in the Air. Uh, least favourite, uh, Darkness Descends. And I give the album a nine out of ten. Oh, fuck yeah. Right. So that gives it an 8.5 overall. Um, what else? Do you want to know what else has an 8.5? Sure. sure. Why not? Uh, reinventing Axl Rose and Spirit World Field Guide. It's a good, good company. company. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so I believe we move on to record LP3, or Laura moves on to LP3 reasonably quickly. I think it came uh, the, very f the very next year, her third album, uh, came out, and I'll let Sersha introduce it. Right, yeah, A Creature I Don't Know. Um, this is the first album she made that wasn't nominated for the Mercury Prize. Um, uh, she would be nominated twice again uh, for Once I Was an Eagle and Song for Our Daughter. Um, two records that I think are equally to the first two, kind of singular visions. Um, even if, you know, I have lots that I'll get onto about Once I Was an Eagle, but I think it's a very good record. Anyway, I'll get onto that. Um, this is, as much as I do like it very much, probably my least favourite of her records. Um, Ditto, actually. Yeah. Um, it, it feels slightly to me like, after reinventing herself, in a way, with her last album, this feels like floundering and reaching for ideas in many ways to me. Um, it doesn't have the, the concept of once I was an eagle or the immediacy of I speak because I can, and it feels slightly caught in the middle. Um, but I do think there are good songs here. Um, for example, when it hits track five, The Beast, I feel like, aha, now Laura is back. Um, and Night After Night is a really beautiful and haunting song. Uh, taking influence from uh, Spanish guitar work. Um, and My Friends is a really lovely textured song as well. I also love Sophia, which reminds me of some of Abba's softer cuts of all things. Um, uh, yeah, and um, I love it when the groove kicks in on that song. It really kicks it up. Mm. But it is the album I have the least to say about. 
because um, as with the other, with the at least with the other album that I don't love so much in her back catalogue, there's like a story behind it that's really interesting as to why it is the way it is. Um, with this, it just feels like uh, treading water slightly to me. Yeah. I, I have to confess, uh, it's also the one that I have the least to say about. Um, I, I I will say, I I was hoping Laura would continue the leap that she made on a speak because I can and continue to kind of branch out the expanses of her sound. Um, but a creature I don't know to me, uh, and I it may not be that it is this, but it's simply how it feels. It feels like leftovers from that record. Uh, and it doesn't seem to me to explore a whole lot of new ground. The other record that I feel is a weird sort of quirky outlier in her career is short movie, but that record does some kind of instrumentally different things that just that yeah. do cause it to stand out. Whereas this does feel again, like treating water, I think is a great way of putting it. That said, my dashed expectations aside, Laura most certainly doesn't drop the ball in terms of, I think general songwriting ability and clarity of focus my issue is that the record seems to lack the conceptual unity and the ambition of its predecessor. While, some, while the songs on here are well-written and unified in and of themselves, there's not really a sense of any greater construction uh, with the album. Uh, Laura's confidence as a performer grows uh, and the instrumental density of many of the arrangements remains attractive and impressive, just as it was on I Speak Because I Can. Um, uh, these again are not immediate songs in the slightest they demand patience of the listener her writing is as inviting as it is elliptical and that feeling of leftovers does dissipate a little bit the more focus and time you give this record uh, if you let it uh, the record will eventually sweep you up and hold you in its grasp if only for short stretches um, the wistful and pretty don't ask me why transitions seamlessly into the more aggressive and propulsive Salinas, which is inspired by the life of John Steinbeck and extends Laura's literary fascination and fascination with the lessons of history and historical figures. I have to confess though that I feel that much of the rest of the record does meander. Uh, I'll give uh, Sophia credit. I think it's a late album standout, but really I don't have too much more to say. It just uh, and the closer is all right too. It just kind of this record kind of just is. <laughs> I agree with that. I would love to see if my feelings change with it for it with time. I listened to it twice, and I did like it more the second time. I will say that, but it wasn't a huge. It, it still feels a bit muddled to me. I was sort of hoping that it would grow on re-listen, as many other of her albums uh, did, and it just never really happened. And I. I mean, I kind of agree with Tyler's assessment that it does feel a lot like it, it. Not only does it feel like leftovers from the previous record, it feels like the less adventurous ones too, which just sort of leaves it to being good in short bursts. The, the consistency that the first two have is just not here. Though I do agree with Sersha. Um, I think the record kind of hits its stride in the middle with The Beast, Night After Night, My Friends, and Rest in the Bed. Um, I think those are really good songs. Um, but everything kind of surrounding them is a little bit more middling, even though I still think she is lyrically still bringing it. I don't think that Laura is, I think that's probably her most consistently impressive thing is how good of a lyricist she is. Um, but, uh, the muse is sort of this upbeat and spry opener, but it kind of feels like a, a, a best of Laura opener on terms of like topics that she'd covered before, a little bit more scattershot. Uh, I was just a card slower even starts out kind of jazzy with those horns in the background, eventually right? blossoms yeah. into something more full sounding. I kind of wish the whole record sounded like this song yeah. because there's a distinct lack of that in her later career that I would just be like, you should absolutely make an album around the idea of being a bit more like, I don't know, band heavy and diverse. Like that would be cool as hell. Um, don't ask me why. I love the strings that appear on, when the sh song crescendos. Uh, Salinas, um, love the ending, uh, please, of Will I Ever See Heaven Again, sort of get at that core uh, of this album, which seems to be uh, Laura using her set tenets of life changing her into 
someone she doesn't really recognize as the title sort of uh, hints at, uh, which I like. I, I like conceptually, but I also think that's done much, 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 much better on a later album, which we'll get to, which might be the next one if I'm remembering correctly. Um, is it the one that's an hour long? Yes, that one. And it's yeah, the it next is. one. Yeah, it, I basically think that like the, the core ethos of this album is done better on the next one. Um, mm. uh, the Beast is a fantastically structured and mystical sounding song that emphasizes Laura's fascination with contextualizing the world through mythology. Night After Night is sort of a gentle guitar medley that guides into this very restrained ballad that I think is sorely missed on this record, which is very focused on, like I said earlier, there's some uh, of these blossoming progressions, which are well done, but they lose the, the intimacy of her other stuff, especially her first two records. Uh, my friends, uh, good storytelling exercise here. Love the sort of cooing vocal harmonies. Uh, Rest in the Bed, uh, more bluegrass influence here, but with a gentler, a little bit more folksy twist. Uh, Sophia, again, it's one of those uh, Laura songs that is like far from bad, but it ends up being kind of nondescript, sort of the esoteric part of her lyrics just sort of end up being kind of like, I, I, maybe if I live with it a little bit more, it'll hit me harder, but you know, the energy is still nice, especially in the song's final third. And All My Rage, high energy closer, feels like a church chorus is joining her for the refrain. Very cathartic, strong way to end the album, but it's just sort of a dicey record it's like i i feel like this maybe needed a little bit more time and then we could sort of arrive at something that's a bit more definitive a bit more full okay and well let's right let's, let's let's move on uh swiftly then since we don't have too much to say about this record uh yeah. jake do you want to go first with your ratings sure um my three favorite tracks are rest in the bed night after night and the beast Least favorite track is probably, uh, hmm, I, I, I might even just say The Muse. I'll say The Muse. Not a bad opener, but uh, mm. my least favorite. And uh, yeah, I give the album a six and a half out of ten. Nice. Um, so my three favorite tracks are the one of The Beast, Night After Night, and My Friends. My least favorite is probably I Was Just a Card. I'm also giving this six and a half out of ten. All right. Uh, my three favorites are Salinas, The Beast, and Sophia. Uh, my least favorite track is Rest in the Bed, and I'll give this a six flat out of ten. Very fair. Very fair. Right. So next, Once I Was an Eagle. Once I Was an Eagle. In many respects, a breakthrough record for Laura, and I only say that because... Uh, well, obviously, it was hugely critically acclaimed, but um, before the most I... most well-received album, it seemed like. Uh, mm -hmm. Even before I met either of you, weirdly enough, before I kind of even knew who Laura Marlin was, uh, this was the album that I kind of heard of and sort of was familiar with and took to be the most sort of representative, I guess, or whatever, and without ever listening to it. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I'll go first because... Um, mm -hmm. I feel it seems that maybe my opinion will be surprisingly divergent from the two of you and that uh, I fucking love this album a lot. Uh, uh, this, I think, is uh, up until this point in Laura's career is, her, is the most uh, accomplished, uh, cohesive piece of work that she's put out. It feels in many respects like uh, what she was building towards. This is a record that she put out when she was 25, I think, and it feels very much like, um, you know, I don't even, I can't, I, don't, I can't even finish this thought, but it, it just does feel to me like a mid 20s record. Like you've matured a little bit, you've matured considerably from um, the sort of humble beginnings that you had, and it's kind of like taking stock at this point. And uh, I think that it's a bold record structurally. Uh, it's a record that I took a few listens, I think, to really get my head around the flow of this record. It opens uh, immediately with a suite of five songs that kind of flow into each other and also, I, I believe, reuse the same melody. I think there's some chord shifts and stuff to distinguish the songs, but they're basically overpaced with each other. 
uh, and that kind of immediately leaps out at you as a bold uh, creative decision for Laura. Uh, the record is incredibly assured in its writing and production. Somehow it sounds and feels even better than the pristine highs of I Speak Because I Can without resorting to cheap indie songwriter tricks like the big climax or the uh, melodramatic writing. Those things can work if you're a certain type of personality, but they would have felt cheap if Laura had employed them to make the songs feel bigger, and she doesn't need to. Um, these songs blossom and bloom and swell uh, within the boundaries of what we've come to expect from Laura's particular sound and style. Um, but they still somehow feel bigger than ever before. Um, it's kind of, it's quite difficult for me to articulate how Laura achieves this. Her voice has never sounded as thrillingly dense and mysterious, layered and imagistic, but as enigmatic as she is emotive. Uh, it's worth, I think, acknowledging um, Laura's continued creative partnership with producer Ethan Johns, uh, who has worked with Ryan Adams, John Bryan, Sarah McLaughlin, Kings of Leon, and Paul McCartney on significant records for all of them uh, as both producer and multi-instrumentalist in various capacities. <laughs> but yeah, the creative partnership between Laura and Ethan feels like it reaches its apotheosis here the two working in symphony to elevate Laura's manifold folk songs into soaring poetic anthems. And all of this while still continuing to resist the hook-driven fodder of the popular folk world that she eschewed from her second album onward. Uh, more reference points come to the fore here, particularly Nick Drake's Brighter Later in Sound and Spirit and Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde in Ambition and Structure. The five-track suite that kicks it off that I talked about indeed plays as one continuous song, such that it's easy to conceptualize Once I Was an Eagle as an 11-track album with a 20-minute opener rather than the 16-track that's presented on paper. And I think once I understood this, the flow of the album began to click for me, almost to the extent that I wish that Laura had just gone full prog and just mashed them <laughs> together into one track. Uh, I think that would be bolder as fuck. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because you can just like not look at the track listing and just listen to the album and you'll still get that experience. Um, and yeah, and I, but I think understanding the, the way this is structured such that it opens with this epic, almost like tone poem that goes on for 20 minutes. Uh, I think that um, it, it dulled the previous feeling that I had, which was that the album was poorly paced and over long in its back half. And, and some of those later tracks started to hit me with more resonance. I don't think it's perfect still, uh, but I do think that there's an embarrassment of riches here that I can't deny. Uh, we're on prior records, Laura's slower moving and more stately pieces treated the line between awe-inspiring and tedious, serenely gripping and utterly beholden to the obvious influences. Here you have songs like Little Love Caster, Little Bird and Pray For Me that brish wistfully along for upwards of six minutes, but never once lose an iota of my attention, in large part due to the way that Laura hypnotically weaves in and out of a blissful arrangement of strums and muted but propulsive percussion. The way that Devil's Resting Place comparatively roars to life might sound tame in comparison to a more bombastic artist, but within Laura's world, it feels positively gigantic. And her ability to manipulate the listener through subtle adjustments to tone and masterful sequencing that allows the punchiest moments to hit so much harder is absolutely the mark of a great and talented artist with a commanding control of her craft. Uh, maybe from what I gather, an underrated song on the record and one of my absolute favorites is Once, which has these gorgeous organ tones and touches that remind me of Talk Talk and elevate what would be a standard folk song in the hands of someone less creative into something elegiac and beautifully spiritual in Laura's hands. Uh, and you have the superb march of the triumphant Save These Words, wrapping up Laura's first capital G great album at the finish line. Um, maybe not the most consistently perfect record, certainly wouldn't say uh, 
that it's the most consistently banger, 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 banger in the way that something like a speak because I can is. But in terms of crafting something that just completely wraps me up into its world and I just drift away with it and don't notice the tracks passing, but also at the same time, don't feel that it ever becomes stale. I think this is perhaps the most cohesively flawless start to finish uh, record for me of Laura's, even though it's not my absolute favorite of hers. Uh, it just is uh, really special. And, and, and when, for someone who's as big of a sound and production geek as I am, the way that this whole thing sounds so rich and, 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 and beautiful and luxurious is, is a real treat um, and, and, and really does feel like Laura leveling up and, and Ethan leveling up, considering that it, this is their culmination of a, of a series of um, collaborations. But yeah, uh, I love this fucking thing. Yeah. Um, personally, I think that I similarly think this record is fantastic. Um, pretty much, I, I co-sign pretty much everything you said, Tyler. It's just that the only thing about it is just, I, I feel like it may be just, it's, it, it, the stride that it hits is just a little bit less my tempo, I suppose. I think it is easily the most ambitious undertaking that Laura has, has gone through in her musical career. Uh, and as a result, it ends up being a, a wildly compelling listen um, just to see how it is structured. And especially with that like five song suite, like really just took me off guard the first time I heard it. I was just kind of like, damn, this is like, <laughs> this is like progressive. Holy shit, Laura. And uh, as such, it deserves to be acknowledged for that. Um, I think it's just that the songs as like a whole, they I feel they maybe work better as the part of a greater whole than they do on an individual basis for me, maybe. Um, Take the Night Off, for example, uh, seems to be a song about uh, undesired sexual inhibition and her struggle to abandon it, and I think that that's sort of the, the beginning of the, the concept and narrative of this album, because, like, as the, what, what the suite does at the very beginning is it sort of uh, lets you know this is a continuous flowing thing, and as a result, it sort of does have an overarching narrative, um, uh, unlike her past few records. Uh, and I do think it's sort of a, a leveling up of the last album of the concept of the tenets by which Laura as a person sort of lived by, mainly that of the cynicism from her first two records that sort of kept her at arm's length with some people, specifically her relationships with men and her relationships with love, um, sort of turning her into something that maybe she is not fully okay with and something that on this record she expresses displeasure at. Um, I was an eagle. Uh, you have the seamless transition from the last song onto this one. Uh, song shows a proclivity to abandon, wanting to be involved with a man, not wanting to be a, as she puts it, a victim of romance. Uh, you know, good for you, honey. Uh, the explosions of the instrumental here, very, very satisfying. Um, you know, a contemplative dwelling on the past with a more than a bit of, of venom on behalf of Laura. Um, Breathe, uh, a song where Laura reflects on the cruelty inflicted by both her and the cruelty that uh, other people have inflicted on her. Um, but also she sort of ties the need... Uh, this sort of needless cruelty is being on uh, the environment around her, the earth as well, through her anger that this situation has spawned. It caused her to summon some form of strength to damage both the people that caused, that inflicted cruelty on her and the world. Um, sort of showing that this has consequences. Uh, Master Hunter picks up the tempo with some clattering percussion. The song has a bit of a country twang to it. She takes opposition against the men in her life by saying that they don't have a hope in hell. Uh, the tone here is quite liberating. Um, it finally hits a bit of a stride from me with Little Love Caster, which is one of my favorite songs of hers. Uh, a beautiful track that serves to be a reflection of the previous song in a way, showing her vulnerability because of this master hunter status she's ta taken on, where the, the distance she's taken from men and in intimacy has resulted in isolation and treating them coldly, uh, becoming a, a frigid specter to them that will fade given in time, like uh, the title, or not the title track, the opening track 
of uh, Alas, I Cannot Swim, ghosts. Sort of a reprise of this idea of becoming a, a ghost uh, to someone else. Um, uh, she admits that she wants to let someone in and have them, as she puts it, stay a while, but her manufactured persona has prevented her from opening up. It's a very lonely sounding track. Yes, uh, and yes. Then, Sorry, goes, just so much. No, I, I, I just, yeah, I, I love that whole, the way she complicates um, the image of this, the image of the character or the version of herself that she presents in these songs and the way she, this figure is, is alternately, yeah, liberating and there's a, there's a real sense of, 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 of liberation and, and I love the hunter imagery and and, and there's a refer, re, recurring references to animals uh, as well yeah. on this record, and I love that. And it's all and that's really kind of gripping. But you also kind of get the complicated and messed up side of this character peeled back as well. And I just love that. Yeah, it shows a lot of really interesting nuance to this character that I feel like only Laura, with her songwriting prowess, could truly accomplish to the best of its ability. And it continues right on to uh, one of my other favorite tracks on the album, which is Devil's Resting Place. There's sort of a rumbling percussion that booms over a steady guitar as this ominous sort of atmosphere builds. Uh, more of an instrumental progression here. It's a very mystical sounding song, and I, I just love the variety of it. Um, the interlude uh, sounds like the score to an old black and white movie. Some very lonely, weeping, weepy strings. I'm not entirely certain as to its placement or, or what purpose it serves though yeah I, I i was gonna say that's that's the only part of the record i don't that does take me out of the experience of it i kind of wish it weren't there the interlude I can, I can i just chime in on that if that's okay go for it yeah because my feeling on it is basically that this album feels really like cinematic you know at points mm -hmm. Uh, like if it, it's an hour long or it's her other records kind of top out at 50 minutes at the longest mm. um, um, and it has a huge scope and so many songs feel like they're trying to capture like you, you, you know the, the match cut in well not the match cut but the cut from the match in um, Lawrence of Arabia almost um, sure that kind of hugeness and with this interlude it, yeah, it feels like the score to a black and white movie. It feels like an intermission in a very old film. Yeah, um, I, I, I think what I was trying to get across was that I don't object at all to the concept of an interlude at this point in the record. It just, this particular one does kind of, the sound of it is a bit jarring. Right, uh, but yes. I suppose like for me, the sound of it is such a key part of why I think it works on the record. I do have a complaint. I think it's too long for the for what it is like it's a bit you know and it's about two minutes long um but i value it existing i just wish it was about a quarter as long cool yeah you the reason saying, it doesn't Jake. work for me personally is because i feel like this record is so cohesive and so focused on fluidity that the moment you break that up it feels really really jarring because the first leg of this album is so fucking good at taking you from one moment of it to the next that it just feels a bit too mm. abrupt for my liking i i again i see what you're getting at in concept i just feel like i, I feel like the album would be improved both if this was shortened or more sonically cohesive with the rest of it or just taken out entirely really but after that we have undyne which is sort of the mythological tale of undyne a smart parallel to laura herself uh on the record saying that she uh lives for the sea which i get as a a reference of the tumultuous nature of the life that she's leading here uh then there's where can i go um uh one of my favorite lyrics of hers it's a curse of mine to be sad at night whole ass mood um, <laughs> yeah. a song about feeling lost uh, it sort of builds into something bright and explosive complete with fucking organs it's a great <laughs> great song um once uh once is about breaking her streak of being more cold-hearted and stepping out of her persona and opening up to someone saying once is enough to break you so she knows the potential fallout of her actions but has had enough of the loneliness and isolation so she wants to break out uh, pray for me. Now that she's opened up, she feels like she's made a mistake, feeling that she's given in to a weakness. Um, then there's when, uh, when were you happy? Uh, for some reason, lyrically, more than anything else, this really reminds me of Phil Elverum, 
which I do feel is an artist that uh, shares a lot of kinship w with Laura in terms yeah, of like I can the see that. Now you see it. Yeah. 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 Like there's a so like the way in which Phil um, approaches very direct emotions from quite a cryptic standpoint at points. Yeah, I was gonna say it's a very um, a, a a bluntness that is expressed very poetically that I feel both yeah. of them uh, very much uh, share. And uh, she speaks here about living like an outsider uh, in the city that she lives in, feeling like she wants to go somewhere else to sort of search for happiness, feeling displaced. Um, love be brave. She finds herself depending on someone uh, she's been intimate with, saying that she doesn't know how she slept before she had their company, which uh, Al finally it's uh, finally a distinct optimistic term uh, turn for her. <laughs> Uh, Little Bird, I enjoy the instrumental build, but I kind of feel like lyrically this is a bit more nondescript than the other songs, and it just, I haven't fully, like, she has songs like this that are just a bit more, um, that are a bit more esoteric, that maybe take a couple of listens, and I could easily see this one being one such listen. It just hasn't really clicked for me yet, uh, but it, it feels like it breaks up the narrative flow that's, again, really, really, really strong here, but I do have, like, the vocal harmonies. Um, Save the Words reminds me of a ballad that you'd find on, like, Mule Variations. This song seems to be her leaving her experience as advice to others who find themselves in, uh, similarly struggling with the things that she has been over the course of the record. It's a great final way to put it all to rest. It sort of explodes into a satisfying emotional crescendo. And, like, it's a, it's, I, I find this album to be exceptionally frustrating in that like i love everything that it is accomplishing and everything that it means for laura as an artist it's just that the the visceralness of of my enjoyment is for some reason lesser than the other ones and i think it's almost just because of the 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 flow and the ambition of the record being both its greatest benefit and its greatest weakness in that it makes the whole album which is very long and I tend to enjoy her when she's being a bit more of a track by track oriented artist when she keeps it lean. Um, whereas here it's a bit more of an experience that does bleed together, but that's sort of a feature, not a bug um, of this album. And it just kind of, it'll, it'll vary from person to person. I appreciate uh, what it accomplishes and how well it does it in most instances. It's just an album that I find myself struggling to truly latch onto like the others of her that I've fully fallen in love with. It just stands firmly in, in the middle of being something that I recognize as being very impressive and that I enjoy a lot, but I just, it, it lacks that immediate impact that I so desperately wish that it had. I don't disagree almost at all with anything you've said. Um, the thing, like, uh, Laura has told the story about the making of her next album, short movie, um, where basically, in between this and that album, she went, like, to an American desert, took a lot of hallucinogens, and, like, had, like, a, a vision experience in the middle of a desert. And throughout the recording of short movie, um, she was microdosing a lot as well. Um, which, A, I think explains a lot about how that album sounds. But you can see the same fascinations show up here um, in a way that this album too kind of feels like like a, a like a like a spirit quest you know um feels like this epic journey of the soul um mm -hmm. it has a very spiritual sort of evoking title like this idea yeah. of past lives and 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 mysticism yeah, and like almost spirit animals in a way, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, also this album brings in influences from mandolins and sitars to evoke almost like psychedelic folk elements across its track list. Yeah. Um, uh, there are examples of this, like uh, Do Devil's Resting Place does this a little bit, uh, Master Hunter does this a little bit, uh, but. If I was to go through a track by track, I love the opening five track suite. Um, I think I need to do a better job of appreciating that as one homogenous thing, so that my flaw, which is I just care less about the back end, um, 
would go away slightly, which you've said it does if you approach it in that way. So I, I want to try and do that more on future listens, which I almost certainly do, because this record is really good. Um, it opens with Take the Night Off, um, which is an amazing song. It's very peaceful, and it's a very pleasant and relaxing song. The use of harmonies in the guitar lines uh, are beautiful. Um, and I just, I love the sentiment of taking someone who is behaving almost as, she says, a uh, be gone beast, um, almost to say, uh, in the state you are, you have become a monster. Go away and take some time to recuperate yourself and uh, take the night off in a way and find yourself again, which is something I as a person need to think about more, especially lately, right? I've been pushing myself far too hard uh, in ways that have been detrimental to not only me, but the people I love. Um, I was an eagle. This song, these two songs flow seamlessly together. And I love the way these opening five songs flow together because it makes it feel like they're about the same people. And nowhere is that better exemplified than in these first two songs. Um, where with the context of their relationship and Take the Night Off, where she says, you were a dove and I was an eagle. It completely paints a portrait of a relationship that you know. Um, I love, love, love the final song of the suite, Master Hunter. Um, the song reminds me of the, uh, the SNL skit where the, two, where the band is recording and one of them is playing the cowbell and is really enthusiastic about playing the cowbell. The only prescription is more <laughs> cowbell. Ba, 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 ba. Um, but the cowbell adds so much to the song, gives it so much energy. Um, and for someone who I think is broadly characterized in the public, is almost like languorous. Um, listen to this song and it's use of cowbell and you will change your mind, good sir. Um, I also um, just really love the song on a songwriting level. It is a raucous jam. But it's also very brooding and threatening and approaches relationships in the way that she always has done in a really fresh way. Um, looking at it from a perspective that maybe hasn't been seen before and idealizing elements of relationships and normally don't get idealized and it makes you look at it in a really fresh way. Um, I love the song Little Love Caster. It's such a like a mournful and soulful song um, and it continues the narrative of the record in really interesting ways. And then you go on to Devil's Resting Place uh, where the vocals are double tracked with very slight disharmony um, and the this creates makes this one of the creepiest songs she has in her entire back catalogue um, and it's been a favorite of hers uh, of, of mine by her for a long time now um, and, and it it it's a very cryptic song um, and it invokes a lot of ideas that are common in mythology about mixing like feminine sexuality and the satanic and the devilish, um, which someone like Neil Gaiman does to incredible effects in American Gods. Um, but this song is from the perspective of someone who thinks about what they're doing in terms of embracing darker sides of sexuality. If we were to take the story literally, satanic intercourse um and understands that this is a weapon to some people um and she sings it with an edge of knowing threat and this makes you uncomfortable doesn't it now go away and think about why um in the way that the best uh, creepy media does it it it's a song that you can understand that element of if you've ever sat upon an internal emotional precipice and contemplated jumping off it. Um, which as someone who struggles with depression and addiction, I have done many times. Um, again, this moves into the interlude, which I like, it's a bit too long for me. Um, Undyne has this like gothic Americana feeling like some Nick Cave records that I really vibe with. Um, also some country influences as well. Um, from here on in, I, I have slightly 
less to say. I love the organs on Where Can I Go. Um, I love the way in which motifs and earlier songs brought back on the closer, on the closer, save these words as in um, musical motifs. Um, Once is a simple and beautiful song. Um, Pray For Me has amazing strings. Um, I think just when you give me the first half, which is so packed with bangers, I feel like you just put a lot of your more slow songs on the back half because that's standard industry practice and I want to be engaging with this more and I think like the, the pacing of the record and the track listing could be better in a way that will make me engage with these songs a lot more. I, I'm very grateful for Jake's um, giving a lot of interpretations for a lot of these songs because I think it gave them, uh, I haven't had the time yet to really dig into uh, what a lot of these songs are about and so I really much I very much enjoyed hearing Jake interpret a lot of the songs in this record and really break down the mm -hmm. lyricism I think maybe perhaps that is where some of the record's biggest strengths do lie and and, in, and I think in all of Laura's records I think the actual songwriting and what she's saying I think takes time to really appreciate because she doesn't have the most commanding vocal presence uh, and it can be very easy to kind of ignore what she's actually singing about and just get so swept up in the intricacy of her arrangements. But, I, and again, I think this is where Once I Was an Eagle really reveals itself as one of her greatest works and that it is so easy to get swept up in, the, in the, how gorgeous the arrangements sound. But then once you go back and really sit down and think about what Laura's uh, the stories and the images that Laura is painting in these songs, there's, there's, there's so much to um, discover and, and, and yeah, I definitely can understand the feelings that the record is a little too long. Certainly there are probably a couple of songs it could do without even, even in my estimation. Um, mm. but, but yeah, I, 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 this is the kind of record I was going, going through Laura's records in, in sequential order. This was the kind of record. Uh, I was hoping for, and it was exactly what I hoped it would be, um, and, and it's awesome. And it's awesome that it gets, uh, it, it gave her a little bit of a wider audience as well. Absolutely. Yeah, there's it a lot to great love about it, no matter how you come down on it, is that I think that this is just in a record with an abundance of things that anybody can latch on to. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And I think this was certainly a breakthrough record for her. Many of the songs on this record are the ones that bought her the most first time listeners um, and I am also just really happy that Tyler found a record that did what he wanted it to do for her. I'm hey really it's, it's not that. the only one in this discography that I'll say that about so don't oh. don't lose your faith yet <laughs> um, yeah let's do our favorite tracks and ratings Jake do you want to go first my three favorite tracks are Little Love Caster, uh, Devil's Resting Place, and I'll say Master Hunter. Uh, least favorite track is either, I'll say Little Bird, and uh, I give the album a 7.5 out of 10. And hey, maybe one day it'll go up a little bit, who knows. Yeah, like most of our records, this one will always have room to grow on you, I think. Yeah. Certainly has room to grow on me, because I think there are layers of this I haven't unpicked. And if there's one thing I know about my favourite artists, is that there's always more like points out of ten there, if you really dig into them. Um, yeah, um, I want to highlight Take the Night Off, Master Hunter, and... There was resting place. I, I don't feel like I want to choose a least favorite track because I just don't want to. Um, and I'm giving this an eight out of 10. Beautiful. My three favorite tracks are I Was an Eagle, Master Hunter, and Once. Uh, I, my least favorite track is The Interlude. Um, and I give this record an 8.5. Oh, nice. Okay, so short movie. Um, Widely regarded as Laura's worst record. It's not my choice, um, but it is, um, spoilers, towards the bottom um, for me. Um, so before we get into it, why don't, Sasha, why don't you, you sort of tinted at it, but why don't you elaborate a little bit more yeah. on the context of leading up to this? So, yeah, this obviously was like nominated for the Mercury Prize, Laura, a huge audience. 
Um, and the thing, what I found about Laura is that um, she has a fan base that's pretty diehard. Um, and they go to her for certain things that they expect to get out of almost every record she does. Short movie is a record that very rarely does those things. Um, it is much more alt rock influenced. The guitars are more often electric than on any other record she's made. Um, although there are classic folk songs, um, this is one that delves very much into crypticism and it's much less specific about the emotional context of various songs. As I alluded to, this is a record that was written and recorded on a lot of drugs. Um, and I think it, it does show in the music, both in the tone and how sporadic the writing can be. I am fascinated to hear what you two think of it. Well, I can... Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I, I will agree with your overall like broad assessment, Sersha, and that I think it's a bit mystifying that this is considered her worst. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, then again, I, I also happen to enjoy. Well, I mean, let's. I, I won't fucking pussyfoot around. It is that the next one is also similarly lowly rated, and I think it's a lot better than people give it credit for. Yeah. Um, but I think this album's really good, even though it doesn't necessarily make the higher half of her discography for me. Um, I, I think it's an interesting little diversion. I think that most of the little experiments, I guess if you want to call them, that she goes on in terms of the actual sound of the record are pretty well realized, and it leads it to being an interesting member of her discography, but it doesn't feel as insubstantial as something like Creature did. Um, it, it feels like a, something worth exploring, even if it doesn't like hit the consistency that her truly great records do. Um, uh, Warrior... Uh, I love, great song, it has kind of a western twang at the start, uh, a song about Laura not letting a lover depend on her too much anymore and breaking free, but it's kind of a vicious song because her partner wounds her in revenge as she pursues her, uh, uh, her own past and comes across a, a priestess who she thinks might be the warrior that she's looking for. Um, an interesting uh, little storytelling diversion here, there's um, False Hope, the next song, which is, has the sinister sounding opening, a bit more of a colorful vocal performance here. Uh, the guitar picks up speed. It's a real rager, even if it's kind of short. Um, I Feel Your Love, a song about the desire for love from a partner to protect you from all harm. It has a spry guitar and clattering percussion to back up its up-tempo speed. Um, Walk Alone. Uh, one of my favorites on the album, a uh, lonely guitar kind of croons gently at the start, so when the violin comes in at the end, it's totally fucking gorgeous. A uh, fantastic little moody ballad. Uh, strange, Laura's confident, emboldened, spoken word-esque uh, beginning here set the tone very well. She sort of gently transitions into a more sing-songy mode. Um, it's a bit repetitive for my liking, but it's an interesting little diversion. Um... Don't Let Me Bring You Down uh, comes back as, a, as another one of my favorites. Uh, lyrically, I think it's pretty fucking great. Are you not really anybody until somebody knows your name? <laughs> Ow. Uh, the lyrics, Laura's not fucking around on this song. It's one of the fullest sounding songs on this fucking thing. And the sly kind of bass on the chorus refrain in the verses is fucking delicious. The bass all over this album fucking rules, by the way. Uh, and then there is um, Gurdjieff, Ger Gurdjieff's daughter. <laughs> she doesn't say it in the song, so I don't know how to fuck to pronounce that shit. Um, it's a strangely sunny-sounding guitar that sort of leads into the song. Love the really playful, bouncy melody Laura's voice conforms to in the verses here. Just a fantastic song. Um, Divine. It, it's a bit slight for my liking, but it's a pleasant enough tune. Uh, how Can I? The guitar slides up and down the song, chord progression sort of steadily evolving more and more as the song progresses. Uh, a song about being torn between the love of someone dear to you but pursuing your own goals and sense of belonging elsewhere. Uh, Howl, uh, one of my favorite songs on here. It's a quiet, more ominous beginning, a darker song about leaving someone you don't want to leave, sort of a companion to the last track. But here there's a sort of connection implied with the distance between her and said person. I love the tone and atmosphere of this song a lot. Um, 
title track short movie, a song where Laura engages in some self-evaluation, sort of using a short movie as a comparison for her experiences up to this point. I think the you she sings about in this song when she says, I can't give, give you up uh, and I'm not going to stop, is just her uh, general sense of ambition. Uh, it's a rather inspiring song. And then Worship Me, a uh, great closer. I think Laura here poses herself as a godlike figure to be worshipped, giving advice to the characters in the song and telling them that it's God that they need. But I think this is more of a dual piece with short movie as I think the characters are Laura herself, praying and worshipping to the idealized version of herself that she hopes to become, that she sort of evolved with over the course of these records, which sort of puts this in a unique place, I think, um, in her discography in terms of her narrative. She had so much emotional nuance in the last album, and this album feels like a bit of a turning point, and it, as a result, it's a little more insubstantial, but I think it's necessary for like her personal progression. But yeah, overall, I think it's a really good album, and um, while not exactly her best in like any way for me, I still think that it earns its place amongst its other records. I think the notion that it's her weakest is kind of ridiculous, but I, I think it's quite good, honestly. Mm. Nice. Well, I'll counter that and say that I, I do find this to be the weakest one, but, really? hm. but I, this is also the only one that I actually only had a chance to listen to once. So I have to put the upfront with that and say that I, it could be that I simply haven't sit, sat with this and really given it enough of a chance. I don't think, I want to make clear when I say that, I don't think it's like measurably worse than a creature I don't know. It's just the one that if I had to rank them, it will, it will go at the bottom. And, I, and it's not for the fact that Laura does diverge with her sound here. I think that's probably the greatest strength of this record is the way that she diverges. Um, context is important though. It's worth acknowledging this uh, album did arise out of a creative blockade in the wake of um, the last record and presumably it would, had, had, would have had something to do with the hype that record received. Um, uh, and I, I, I could be wrong, but I believe Laura was working on some music that she scrapped to make this. Um, so this is this is very much kind of a, a, tr a, a her trying to kind of clear the slate and figure shit out. Um, she describes it as quote the middle of a thought rather than the conclusion, uh, and and to me it does have that sense of a lack of finality and more of a kind of drifting um, that I don't particularly attach myself to all that much, or at least not yet. Uh, it's also notable in that this record sees Laura depart from her creative partnership with Ethan Johns, that I talked about in the last three records, uh, and she self-produced this album. Uh, and, and the result of that is a record at which does feel like Laura taking stock, clearing the slate a little before the next stage of her career. Uh, and I don't want to diminish the individual creative developments that are present here and the risks that are taken to push against the edges of Laura's established sound. Uh, I, I, I do dig the um, first three tracks in particular, I think are probably the best songs on the record. Uh, I, I like the uh, apparently inspired by Hodorowsky opener Warrior, uh, which I believe is specifically inspired by the Holy Mountain and Laura's dabbling with um, drugs and the desert. Uh, it's not surprising that an interest yeah. in Hodorowsky is tied up in that. Uh, and, and, and yeah, like the, the song does have a Western feel and it thrums with a forward motion that I really enjoy. Uh, I, I, I think that it's really cool and stark and surprising when Laura goes fully electric with the heavy twang of false hope. Um, and for much of the rest of the record, she kind of gently flits between lilting, intricate acoustic mode and twinkling electric lullabies. Uh, and I guess just, at least in my experience so far, uh, very little of it sticks with the impact of her best records. And again, I don't really think there's anything bad here. Uh, in fact, the list, the actual um, experience of listening to it is quite delightful, um, but it is her second longest record and the length I do feel where I don't 
as much feel it on the previous album. Um, uh, and, and, and it's especially an issue when some of the songwriting, again, the songwriting's not bad, but there's a lack of memorability. There's a lack of real grip to it, at least for me so far. Um, I see the place that it has in her discography, um, but I really don't have too much to add about it. Yeah, I think it's really important what you said, that Laura said about this being the middle of a thought. Um, and like her records have gotten more and more dense and complicated as she's gone on um, in a way that really resonates with that story about how it was made um, and that it feels like it's increasingly going in to a very hazy fugue and this record feels like the very end of that process. Whereas I think the next record feels in a way coming out of the last few records since um, I speak because I can with a more informed clarity of thought and purpose. Um, whilst I like this record, I don't think she has a bad song at all. So all of the records amount to something worth listening to in my opinion this is the one that feels the least coherent to me. Um, and whilst it has its highlights like uh, False Hope, Strange, uh, Short Movie, it's a really beautiful and eerie uh, song. Uh, much more of a rock song than anything else on the record by maybe False Hope, which I also love a lot. Um, it builds so beautifully. And I think Worship Me is a beautiful closer. Um, it, this does feel like the middle of a thought. It feels like half measures in a way, whereas the two records I, either side of it really commit to an idea that is new for the artist. And while this does commit to ideas that are new for the artist, they are, for me, primarily aesthetic ideas in terms of instrumentation choices, in terms of tone, and not really lyrically or substantive, substantively. Excuse me. Um, again, Every song here is good, and I like this more than um, A Creature I Don't Know, because I feel like the hit right here is better. Um, but th it shares a similar problem with A Creature I Don't Know, and that I'm like, okay, okay, but why am I like, listening to this record, not any of your other records? Sure. All right, well, All right. let's switch on to favorite tracks then. Yeah. Um, I'll go first if you want. Uh, sure. um, my three favorite tracks are the first three, Warrior, False Hope, and I Feel Your Love. My least favorite track is How Can I? And I give the album a six out of 10. Wonderful. Um, so that's me. My favorite tracks, as um, I've already alluded to, uh, False Hope, Don't Let Me Bring You Down, and Short Movie. I'm going to give this record a, a seven. My three favorite tracks are uh, Walk Alone, Don't Let Me Bring You Down, Gurdjieff's Daughter, and um, was that only two? Did I, say, did I say Howl? No, I didn't uh, say You Howl. did not say Howl. I'm, I'm, howl. I'm stupid. Yeah, Howl. <laughs> uh, least favorite track, um, probably Divine, and I give the album a seven. Neat. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, we move swiftly along to uh, a new era, 2017, uh, with Laura's lowest rated album on both Rate Your Music and Sputnik Music, uh, Semper, Semper Femina. Uh, Sersha, why don't you introduce this record and go first with your review I, and talk about I would love to. Uh, what this record is. is. Okay, so Semper Femina comes from Virgil. Um, and it is translated as, uh, for him, uh, women is ever changing, uh, is, is ever, sorry, women is ever a fickle and changeable thing, is what Semper Femina means. Um, and this very much 
seems to be the arrival of a new Laura into a new security in herself and her own songwriting capability. Um, there are simultaneously less uh, bells and whistles on this record than anything she's made since her first record, and way more creative risks than almost anything she's made for me. Um, perfectly exampled by the opener, Soothing, um, which is maybe the strangest song she's ever made. Um, <laughs> fucking three minutes of her doing the bark, bark, woof, woof, Twitter, I'm horny meme. <laughs> Okay, so here's the funny <laughs> thing about that. Um, I was a Laura fan when the music video for this dropped as a promo single. Um, and this is, what the fuck are you doing, Laura? But, so on the cover, you have a, a black thing, right? Which in the music video, which is directed by Laura, is a, a latex costume that goes down here, across here, and then down, doesn't cover a leg, and just goes under the crotch and back up again. Um, and the music video features basically two women, one in a black one, one in a red one, writhing around on a bed. And it was directed oh. by Laura. <laughs> hmm. Damn. This also leads on to the fact that this is the easiest record to take queer readings to by quite a long way. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, lots of female pronouns as objects of romantic desire uh, by Laura. Um, not least in Soothing, but also in uh, something... Did I write it down? Anyway, other records on the album, other songs on the album. Um, I also think Soothing is such a, a crazy instrumental palette um, boom, with... Boom, doo, doo, doo. Like, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? Awesome. Right, it I it almost represents like a direction Laura could have gone in into more like experimental songwriting, um, but I love the fact that she still made what sounds like a conventional Laura Marling record whilst really forging a new identity with it. If the last record was Laura reaching the pinnacle of more hazy, complicated, abstract songwriting. This feels like walking out of the fog and into the sunshine in its stark clarity and singular ability to express ideas well and immediately. Um, the second track, The Valley, expresses this really well. It is a beautiful, uh, sonically poetic ballad uh, that has, again, Many female, many female pronouns as objects of romantic interest. Um, it could also be read that the central character is Laura herself um, and how she wants to try to be a different person. But a queer reading where Laura is romantically or sexually desiring the central character is also really interesting to me. Um, yeah. Um, I love the lines, like, um, I ask her what she's mourning I know it can't be spoke, just that really hits me in the heart. Um, I love you in the morning, I love you in the day, I love you in the evening, if only she would stay. Um, and those strings are just from another planet. Um, I really elevate the song. Uh, Wildfire is a beautiful, flowing, soulful uh, folk ballad about love. Um, and, and, and it's just so, like many songs on this record, it's like just a warm blankety hug and like hot cocoa, and it's just soothing. I, I, I had songs. that exact same image yeah. in my mind listening to this, yeah. It feels like Laura is abandoning a lot of pretenses with this record. Not that I criticize that in the other records, but... This feels like a much more straightforward record, and it is only for the better of itself. Um, Don't Pass Me By is... Um, the, it has a wonderful, like, fuzzy guitar, and the whole... F it reminded me almost at points of, like, a Portishead song. Um, I, I had that thought multiple times as well. Especially on Soothing specifically, but also on this one. It was weird to say that about Laura Marling's song, doesn't it? Like, it reminds me of a uh, Dummy. Uh, yeah, yeah, specifically Dummy. Yeah. Um, 
but I love Don't Pass Me By. Always This Way is another fuzzy, cozy record, but it's way more fun. And I could just listen to it for days on end. Like, if you were to lock me in a room and the only stimulus was food, water, and this song on loop, <laughs> it would take about a week before I complain. Because um, <laughs> it's just so pleasant and lovely. Um, wild, um, wild Ones uh, find... It's the only song I'm not totally enthusiastic about because uh, Laura's speak singing with that like cut glass accent really throws me off every time. And I suspect that's a subjective thing. I don't see that being a criticism that people have. It just, it feels weird to me. Um, but this is before two of my favorite Laura Marling songs on the back end of this record being uh, Next Time with this wonderful uh, bouncing recurring guitar line um, and like Razor, Buzz Razor, electric guitars coming in towards the end, matching strings, lends it a whole other dimension. Um, and it, it's, it's just, the lyrics are really lovely as well. Um, Noel is another really great song, but I have to talk about Nothing Not Nearly. Um, mm. this is, hey, this might be my favorite Laura Marling closer. Um, might be my favorite song of hers. Um, it's a band. It's a very it's a very important song to me. I taught my mother to play it on piano. Um, and it's, it's just, I, the use of slide guitars is, is perfect. And it's got such a like, I feel it, the texture of it is like running your hand along like, see, like a steel wool um, cloth for cleaning dishes. Yeah, um, I, I, that's so perfect. That's yeah. exactly the guitar yeah. tone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've used them a lot in art lessons, <laughs> but it's and I just I love the sentiment. I love the way in which the lyrics don't change verse to verse, but the lyrics are recontextualized by the way the melody changes around them to make to make them mean different things verse to verse, um, and it's just so beautiful, um, and I. It's got such a lovely sentiment of uh, pushing through hard times because there's good stuff there for you. Um, you know, the, the, the only thing I learned in a year where I didn't smile once, not really. Nothing matters more than love that no, no, nothing, no, not nearly. We've, we've not got long, you know, to bask at the afterglow. Once it's gone, it's gone, love waits for no one. It's like when we reviewed, uh, not reviewed, but talked about uh, Brave Faces Everyone, where the only thing we could do was just recount lyrics from it to talk about why the, it's so effective. Um, and like Brave Faces Everyone, the music, of course, does so much heavy lifting, but this is some of Laura's most uh, unassuming but potent songwriting, in my opinion. And that is representative of the whole record. It's, it's like going back to that clarity of thought that was there on the first record and taking that and incorporating all you've learned about songwriting with the ambition of the records before this and bring it all together in something really, really fantastic. Um, I know this is the lowest rated on Spudnik and Radio Music. It is a fan favorite amongst the hardcore Laura Marling fans. And it's not hard to see why, because um, when you have an understanding of the, of the way she communicates with her music, this is like another level for me. I agree because before I really, I, I really dug into this um, discography for a while. This was my favorite Laura Marling album, and then it just it got slightly edged out by uh, Speak Because I Can. That said, I still think this is phenomenal. I think the the closest comparison that I could draw with how this album feels instrumentally is that it's obviously not as uh, dense or overwhelming as this artist uh, can be, but Semper for Mina, for me, sounds a lot like Julia Holter, uh, specifically on songs like The Valley, which I fucking love. It's one of the most beautiful songs that she has ever come up with. Um, I do also really love Soothing. I love how it's got that weird, moody, kind of playful bass, and then it just 
and then the rest of the song is just mm. fucking it, she's like mewling it's fucking yeah. bizarre but i'm just like i'm i'm into this whatever this like is like the way the way it like brings in strings at first reminds me of like specter by radiohead um <laughs> yeah. and then they yeah and then like a mandolin comes in on the chorus and it's just ah so many different it's, things but it's so cohesive it's one of her most interesting instrumentally like varied albums i'd probably say it is her most instrumentally varied album mm. and um it's like I, I the guitar even on soothing is so fucking groovy it, it's it's mm. disgusting i love it <laughs> and uh that sort of continued on um wildfire there's such a seductive confidence to her vocal delivery i uh, love the storytelling uh, don't pass me by has this incredible distorted guitar in the background as the percussion kind of plods along it gives it kind of a darker atmosphere love the way co the chord progression changes up at the end of each chorus repeat all it goes back to how flawless she is at structuring her songs which i think has honestly reached its apex on this record um Always This Way has some great sonic texture. Reminds me of a gentler Tom Waits ballad. Uh, Wild Wants, another gentle ballad reflecting on youth. Not just her youth, but youth as a concept. Uh, another song sort of framed as giving sort of helpful, loving advice that I uh, love from her. Because, it may, again, warm blanket vibes. Just her kind of being like, this is, this is what you can learn from my experience, dear child. And I'll be like, yes, Laura, please help me. Um, uh, next time is about reflecting on your mistakes, learning from them in a very intimate way. Uh, the proclivity to slip back into harmful habits despite this. Uh, love the fucking structure here, the gradual addition of instrumentation as the song goes on. Amazing. Uh, I will, uh, you kind of skipped over it to get to, uh, Nothing Not Nearly, which flawless but i will take that as an excuse to go into noel which i think is one of her best songs uh, a song about the at least the way i read it this is an album i feel like is the most likely to have multiple readings of interpretations on different songs because it's like again it's the apex of her instrumental variety but i also feel like it's the apex of her esoteric lyricism but i think it all really works here uh, Noel, I read as a song being about the relationship an artist has with their muse, framed as a very deep friendship, servitude, or even romantic love. Uh, and it shows the multiple ways one can interact with this muse, and it just has some of her best lyricism. The comparative minimalism of this song makes it feel so fucking intimate, and I love that. It's kind of the microcosm of the album in general, and I feel like her sort of attitude uh, making it. And nothing, not nearly, just, you know, closes out the album, fucking, uh, an electric guitar, more spirited vocal delivery in the song, uh, about the importance and prevalence of love with some delivery that builds very warm, cozy imagery. And to love one, it's a satisfying conclusion, but also like a, a beautiful mirror to the cynicism that she showed on those first two records. I feel like this is her at her most nuance of her growing and transforming and learning and then finally being able to accept and enjoy the love in her life for what it is and seeing that progression listening to all these in order and seeing her get to here on this final song is so fucking emotionally satisfying i i, I feel i feel held by this album uh and i love it very very much it's a it's a great record um and it's it, it does not get its its due it seems mm -hmm. um Damn you, rate your music. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, this is the bass Laura Marling album. Woo! Yes! yes! Yeah. Let's fucking go! Uh, yeah. And I wish I could say, like, comfortably. And I was gonna say comfortably, but then fucking Song for Her Daughter snuck up on me. We'll get to that. But no, this is... Uh, as we sit here right now, this is my favorite uh, record she's done. And I think you've done a really great job of articulating uh, a, a good chunk of the reasons why. Uh, it's, I think, the most, uh, at least, as far, again, I have not spent enough time fully unpacking the meaning of, and themes of these records as I need to. But in my estimation, from what I've gathered and with the help of what you've um, told me, I think this is the most conceptually unified and um, moving uh, record that she's made. Um, not that there's not competition for that, but certainly it feels there's a it feels as though there's a real arc to this that you've just touched on. Uh, 
uh, that's really poignant and, and again, does kind of carry back uh, through her discography and, and, and helps you to kind of see where she's at now. It's like, it's almost like every five years, like she, every five years of her life from when she was fucking, when she was 18 uh, and made the, her first record and then when she was 23 and made uh, Once I Was an Eagle and now she's, it's almost another five years that have passed and she's at this new kind of stage of her life that she's entering and reflecting on her womanhood and on um, who she is as a person, as a creative. One thing I want to touch on, um, Saoirse's helpfully uh, unpacked the title of the record, but I want to just give it a little bit more um, detail to it. Uh, specifically, the words Semper Femina literally translate to woman always. Um, the uh, fickle and changeable uh, part is a, an addendum to that quote. Uh, the full quote uh, is from Virgil's Aeneid, which is Virium et muta, mutabili semper femina. And, and, uh, this, and I think it's meaningful that um, Laura has isolated those two words specifically, woman always, um, to uh, get to the heart of this record. And, and certainly uh, I, 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 I think I understand the desire to leap to the queer readings as well. And I think it's undeniable that Laura, to a certain extent, welcomes that in the way that she structures these songs. Uh, these are songs about um, unity and shared love between women. Um, but like, but yeah, yeah. And, and it, they're deeply moving. Uh, I think that, um, uh, the song which features those uh, words Semper Femina, which is Noel, uh, is a key track that Jake has um, unpacked beautifully with regard to um, the, this key theme of the relationship between women and this, uh, and, and really the relationship between Laura and her own womanhood and the relationship between Laura's womanhood and Laura's identity as an artist. Uh, unpacked in that track in particular, but all across this record as well. Uh, I think that um, uh, maybe my favorite track here, uh, purely for how baller it sounds, is the opening track. Uh, like all great album openers, it immediately announces a unique spin on the artist's tone, sound, and themes that will go on to unify the record as a singular and cohesive statement within the artist's discography. Uh, Semper Femina is perhaps Laura's most deceptively straightforward record, an initially curious and unyielding beast that unravels itself the more you listen and the closer you listen. This is the only album we're discussing today that as soon as I finished hearing it for the first time, I immediately put it on again because I wanted to listen to it for a second time and because I felt like I was on the cusp of unlocking it and then like magic, it just happened. Um, and perhaps um, with Soothing having been the lead single, perhaps uh, expectations were set for this record that it did not, that it subverted in a way that maybe left people uh, cold. I don't know, maybe that's why it, um, it has rated so comparatively lowly, but I can't really understand that because if you give this record any measure of attention, it's immediately clear how just great it sounds and how, uh, uh, incredible the songwriting is just like uh, Soothing is a, is, a, is a remarkable piece of music you have these two distinct and very different basses that are both being played in tandem uh, driving the piece uh, and the effect is immediate and intense though couched in minimalism and I think that uh, little phrase immediate, intense and couched in minimalism is a great um, summary for how Laura's music works. Uh, once again, she thre threads the same balance between direct songstress writing mode and subtly rich and gorgeous arrangements, such that one of these things never distracts from the other, but that the two are mutually enhancing. Laura allows her pieces to breathe more than ever before. This is an album of just nine delicate songs that all range from four to nearly six minutes. Uh, the longest piece here, The Valley, is utterly gorgeous in its expansive and luxurious palette. It feels more fulsome and rich than anything on short movie, 
and affirms Laura's place as one of the most detail-oriented and precise folk musicians in the alternative sphere. I love the unexpected punchiness of the drums on Wildfire, with its languorous echoing keys and warm bass that feels as though it is washing across the mix like a shoreline. Uh, the, there's so many instrumental details like that, and like the guitar and um, in the track, Don't Pass Me By as well, that immediately stand out and don't feel as though they're just cushioned in there to make the song sound more interesting, but that they're complementing writing that's more playfully complex than you might expect. Um, and I, I wish I could really dig into it, but again, I haven't spent enough time with it to really get into the writing. But one thing I do want to shout out is um, that this record is notable uh, in my opinion, I think that you would be hard pressed to disagree with me that this is Laura's most immaculately produced and crisply mixed record uh, by some margin. Not to say that her other records don't sound great, but as soon as this starts and throughout its duration, with one exception actually, uh, this is absolutely pristine sounding just in terms of the mixing and we have Blake... certainly this one and her second one where that really leapt out to me as an appeal of the record mm -hmm. uh the the reason the person we have to thank for this particular sound is uh producer blake mills uh blake mills was behind the boards on many of the most perfect sounding records of recent years including both of the last two perfume genius records and alabama shakes's sound and color uh oh. Uh, Blake Mills uh, enhances Laura's earthy, soulful affectations and arrangements, resulting in the most fulsome and least minimal sounding record of hers to date, uh, in my opinion. Though a curious exception is uh, the track Noel, which is actually has a strangely lo-fi quality to it that is clearly intentional because it starkly stands out from the mix of the rest of the record. Uh, really threw me off guard the first time I heard it. Um, but then coming back to the record the second time, I appreciated it, appreciated it a little bit more as the lo-fi quality of this track felt appropriate because it was a track in which Laura was really uh, undressing herself, so to speak, um, interrogating her identity as an artist and her fallibility. And, and um, Jake's already touched on that song better than I ever could. Um, I really want to shout out the lushness of Next Time, which is an amazing song, uh, as ornate and as stunning as anything you would find on, for example, a Wise Blood record, um, and, and just, but just perfectly imbued with, with Laura's character. Um, and also, I, I, I love that this is, this is quite a dark song as well, like, Laura, I don't, this perhaps might be a bit of a reach of an interpretation, but um, Laura seems to be kind of um, critical of people who are not necessarily taking a crisis around them as seriously as they should be. Um, uh, she, she speaks of this in the lines, I can no longer close my eyes while the world around me dies. At the hands of folks like me, it seems they fail to see there may never next time be and uh, perhaps it's difficult to know what she's talking about here i, I it, it makes one think of the climate crisis for instance but um it's interesting that this is um um uh, more outwardly concerned with um it's almost like as close as laura has come to a protest song even though she keeps it elliptical enough to not actually be there and be kind of within her realm of, of interrogating herself and the relationships with other people and that sort of thing. I just dig how it's got a curious little bit of a wrinkle there. Um, but yeah, uh, and of course the raw and serrating guitar tone of the fantastic and uplifting closer, nothing not nearly uh, rightfully acknowledged by both of you as uh, one of her most significant and cathartic songs um, is this just uh, such a tightly packed record? Um, it's like, yeah, I, I, whereas I really dug the expansive swell and sweeping qualities of Once I Was an Eagle, this is something much more 
tightly wound and it benefits from that as well. Uh, I think that with enough focus and attention, uh, it can be appreciated by anyone who has good taste, really. Um, and, <laughs> and there's no reason why anyone should be, without hearing it, should be concerned that it's a weaker record of hers or be put off from listening to it. It is absolutely outstanding. Uh, and and I love it. Justice! God, makes me so happy to hear that. All right. I, uh, what order do we, do we uh, want to do this? Um, I'll go first. Reverse order, sure. why not? Um, oh my, my three favorite tracks are Soothing, uh, The Valley, and Nothing Not Nearly, I guess. Um, my least favorite track, if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick Always This Way. Uh, and I give this album a... Fuck it, nine out of ten. My favorite tracks are "Soothing," "How Could It Not Be," uh, "The Valley," and uh, "Nothing Not Nearly." And I'm gonna give this album nine and a half out of ten. Six. Well, I suppose that leaves me. Um. Yes. Um. Uh, two of my favorite tracks are also Soothing and The Valley, uh, and I'm going to also throw in Noel. Uh, <laughs> least favorite track? Uh, 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 I don't really You don't have, have to choose one. one. I don't have one. All the songs are good. Nine out of ten. Yes. All right. So that's 9.17. Um, that's fire. Yeah, honestly, um, there isn't exactly a 9.2. Um, in any of our albums, uh, but uh, it's somewhere between Third Eye Blind, 14 Autumns, and Bedlam and Goliath. Wow. Shit. Okay. Damn. Um, just, boy. yeah, it would be like so much lower if the other two people were here. But let's... <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, let's, let's forget that. I just want to shout out before we move on uh, on the music board page for this. There's a review of this album from a user called. Laura Marling, um, and it, Laura Marling gives Semper Femina five stars, and the review simply states three words for the suffix. <laughs> I, was, I was so tempted in my analysis to say I think a lot of the lyrical readings of this are sapphic in nature, but I, I, I chose to abstain. I swear to God, if you haven't seen it, as soon as this is done, both of you go, it's a music video for Soothing, I, and then I, come I, back to me. I, I to I'm, I'm going to open the fucking tab right now. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was, maybe that was a little too enthusiastic. Oh yeah, crank one out, just kidding. <laughs> All right, so let's move on now to the last record we're going to discuss today, the most recent one, uh, 2020's Song for Our Daughter. Sersha. Yeah, so I've already um, talked about Semper Femina as, as, as an album that feels like stepping out of like a youthful haze um, and sort of approaching your own material with a new sort of maturity and prowess. And this feels like the sort of maturation of that, you know, this is in a way for me why I feel like this album when it came out lit the blue touch paper with so many Laura fans is that it felt like the promise made by Semper is answered by this record in that it is, it has all of that maturity mixed with the complex music and lyrics, um, but it's, it seems to come together so much better. Um, I say that already as someone who loves Semper Femina. There is not a song here that doesn't make me feel very deeply emotional. Alexandra invokes a lot of classic mythology, asking the question, where did Alexandra go? The key line here is, why should I die uh, so that you could live? This ties back to what she was doing on the very first record in um, appropriating male stories and reappropriating them in female ways that question masculine dominance in storytelling. And Alexandria, Alexandra, sorry, does all of this in what is unquestionably a bop. The lead single from this record is track two, Held Down, 
which when it dropped promised a lot for the record because this song is amazing um the vocal harmonies the creeping bass the slowly shifting melody all together with a song that is talking in the purely emotional but in ways that suggest the sexual um it's it creates a tone that's like it's like a monologue by a classic like femme fatale in a noir film um but in a much more up to the minute uh way um if it's a much more contemporary way uh and the way she says that we all want to be held down we all want to be here now and i i, I never wanted uh to um i i was just going to tell you that i don't want to let you down it looks at a relationship in all of these different ways, in such a coherent way. Um, and I think for so many people, this song resonates with the ways in which maybe we do want to, in some way, be sublimated by another person in that kind of perfect unity. Um, we do want to give ourselves up to another person in a way that Laura criticised so readily on her first album. Mm. I feel like this is a song that looks at that relationship and, and I still feel like there's truth in those early songs. So it looks in people that romanticize that type of relationship without understanding what it means or being ready to do all of the responsibilities that kind of relationship calls for. But this relationship identifies the fact there is that clear need in all of us that in a way, what you really get out of a good relationship is that kind of intertwinedness. And it's also kind of kinky. Yeah, I want to be fucking hell down. Go on. Um, Strange Girl, um, although it's not the song for her daughter, feels like a song for her daughter. It identifies... Um, have any of you read Mrs. Dalloway? Basically, uh, one of the final sentences in that book is about Mrs. Dalloway, who is this housewife who feels like she hasn't got the most she could do out of life seeing her daughter, who is a suffragette, go off on a bus into an uncertain future. Um, and this song resonates with that moment in that book that I studied at school, which is why I can just drop that reference from a hack. Um, it resonates with that moment so perfectly. Um, it feels like it's looking at the younger generation, so almost a younger Laura, you know, who... Um, want to rebel against everything. Um, and whilst acknowledging the naivety of being so young, acknowledges the, the validity of that lifestyle. Um, there's a line here where she says, um, I, I had the lyric booklet here. Um, there's a line here where she says, what well, you kept falling for narcissists who insist you call them man. That's very to do with Laura's early music and speaking to a younger Laura. But there's also um, the line about um, announce yourself as socialist to have something to defend. And as a socialist, I have to take the hit here. I knew you um, bring that line up. I was like, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, okay, I can't wait to hear Suresh talk about that line. I was going to see this is a <laughs> podcast full of socialists that had to come up eventually. I mean, I mean, look, I can't pretend like she doesn't have a point. Um, but no, um, I love the song and I love the way in, uh, it reminds me of Karen Car- uh, Karen Carpenter, what am I talking about? Carol King's Tapestry, which is one of my favorite records um, in the way in which it blends folk and more sort of upbeat pop music in that way. Um, also, um, Amy Winehouse is a big fan of Tapestry and I can hear that blend happening in her music as well. Um, only the Strong Survive is the first really mellow song on the record, uh, the first sort of real folk ballad. Um, again, if we are looking at this record as a, like a series of essays that one would write to either one's younger self or one's younger offspring, this is a song that says with unsatisfied resignedness that one one has to be strong in situations where one would rather not be, I think. Um, 
again, only the strong survive is something that parents tell children about how hard the world is. Because as much as I preach kindness, the world is a horrible and nasty place. Um, and I think the song really nicely captures that dichotomy. Um, blow by Blow um, is a fucking heartbreaker. It tells the story of an aftermath of a unspecified horrific event. But it doesn't frame this horrific event as a singular incident. The chorus identifies that life is filled with slow miseries that chip away at you. Uh, note by note, blow by blow, seeing it all laid out, I should have known. This chorus identifies the central theme of um, slow degradation that you should have seen coming. And given the place I am in my life at the moment, I really identify with that. Um, I've been out driving with my mum because I'm practicing for my driver's license. I introduced my mum to Laura Marling this year when I ordered the vinyl and they sent me the CD and I gave it to her. And many a time, my mother has openly wept next to me in a car while I'm driving to this song. Um, boy, does it mean a bunch to me. Um, because music does that for people. It can unify you in experiences that you'd rather not verbalize yourself, especially in songs like this. Mm. Sometimes, where... sometimes the hardest thing to learn is what you get from what you lose. What a fucking line that is. Uh, yeah, for real. It I had is to take a fucking moment when I fucking heard that this morning. Yeah, just... that was just like... I, I, that's like a fucking, like, that picture of, um, I can't remember who, but it's like the Twitter meme, they're just standing out. It's Quentin Tarantino staring out the window. It's like... <laughs> that's me when I hear yeah, this for, for me, it's it's the two M&Ms, and one of them is dying on the ground, and he says, are you okay? And he says, I'm okay. And he says, no, you're not okay. It's okay to not be okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, I also want to oh. highlight the line, um, uh, knowing thunder gives away what lightning tries to hide. Oh, and so fuck. such a uni- I love that fucking line. Such a universality to just being a human being. Um, uh, what I'm holding is the inslip of the vinyl that you can see over there. And it has the, the lyrics to each side of the vinyl. So I'll tell you now, turning it over, the first song on the B side is the title track, Song for Our Daughter. One of my favorite songs of last year. It's a song I still really struggle to put into words as I think I did when we talked about it because it's so perfectly formed and powerful to me that almost when I talk about it, I'm like, you should just listen to the song and then you'll get it. I love the structuring of the song. I love the way that piano solos and uh, violin solos come in at unexpected moments, but moments that are perfect to highlight the emotional resonances of the songs of the song in particular places. Um, especially the string solo after the line. Um, Lately, I've been thinking about our daughter growing old and all of the bullshit that she might be told. Even though I'm 22, the frankness of that line takes me to that experience where you put your whole life into someone and then the only thing you can picture is how short that life is. I think the ultimate sacrifice parents give is knowing that their child's time is limited, but trying to do make sure their child does the best they can with their short time on earth, whilst knowing it's finite. That's almost to me more profound than knowing your own life is finite. Um, and I think that line particularly captures that, um, especially lines about passing down knowledge, like leaving books that influence you by your daughter's bed so that they might one day pick it up and learn from it. I almost feel like this whole album is the book that Laura leaves by her daughter's bed, a compilation of her own experiences to be passed down to her daughter to maybe do better from. And in this way, this album does what Laura has always done, being emotionally frank about a unique experience but it frames it in a way that's maybe more emotionally relevant than she's ever done, emotionally potent than she's ever done, and framing it 
like a missive to future generations. The end of the affair is a real heartbreaker. Uh, something Tyler said when we talked about this album before on the podcast, that it's uh, thematically strong about a f- family units. This is one of the most interesting songs in that context, um, in how it looks at the end of an affair in the context of the familial unit, and that this is a individual relationship that could be considered a family, and it's, and it's over. I threw my head onto his chest, I think we did our best, uh, but now we must make good on words to God, answered with a weary breath. I fear we've been lost here for too long. This song is is a heartbreaker, as I've said, and it's just almost in the way the brief encounter does. So it makes you sympathise with two characters who can never be together because of their circumstances, as they drift apart from each other in separate orbits. Hope We Meet Again is a classically Laura brooding tract, but uh, for you, the closer, boy, do I love this song. Uh, the bringing in of a barbershop quartet to do the backing instrumentation is a masterstroke. And the chorus, um, I thank you God I've never met, never loved, never wanted for you. It's such a resignation to just being alive as a person and the randomness of life. And I fucking love it. This is my favorite Laura Marling record. Uh, When this came out, I was talking to Millie and we agreed that Semper Femina was our previous favorite Laura Marling record, but this maybe surpassed it. And it's only grown on me more since I listened to it. To the point where it was my second favorite record of last year. I Mm. fucking adore this album so much. And it, it only came out a short time ago. Yeah, I, I, I'll keep the energy up. This album is fucking fantastic. And it I think of all of the albums of Laura's that I've heard, and, and, uh, in terms of where I am now anyway, because I've still got much more time to spend with many of them. But this is the one that's grown on me the most. And it's also the one I've heard the most, just because it was the first one I heard. And I revisited it multiple times before we I even began attempting to prepare for this video. Uh, and the first time I heard it, I, I thought that it was it was good, a, a good album, but it didn't really grab me. I didn't really understand who Laura was or where she was coming from. Um, and it's a shame, I think. Uh, but yeah, the more time I've spent with this and having it contextualized in terms of where Laura is at, particularly coming off of the back of Semper Femina, which has this own, it's such a, which serves as such a beautiful kind of like, uh climax of the arc of her artistic career as we've talked about uh it this feels like if that is that kind of climax this is kind of a blossoming uh into a new kind of phase of life and in the first time i heard this album i was struck and challenged by how stripped back and not immediate it was compared to what i expected and yet revisiting it in the context of her discography, it's striking how immediate this album actually is. Uh, it's notable for being uh, Laura reuniting with Ethan Johns, who produced I Speak Because I Can and Once I Was an Eagle. Uh, and, and together, uh, Laura, with him, Laura turns in some of the most jaunty, striking and gripping songs of her career, signified in particular by the lead off one-two punch of Alexandra and held down uh, two songs which both feel like instant classics for Laura and leave an indelible impression from the jump. Uh, In fact, held down is one of the richest and most soaring tracks Laura has ever released. And it's delightful how she manages to retain that energy through much of the record, uh, imbuing the most vibrant and busy songs with uh, fantastic mixes and a great sense of clarity and even the slower and more uh, spear tracks like um, Blow by Blow and Hope We Meet Again have a real sense of oh, fulsomeness and emotion to them that's already been touched on that I think really elevates them in a way that similar tracks on earlier records don't quite have. And it's... Um, uh, yeah, I think this is remarkably consistent 
front to back. Um, Strange Girl has an addictive hooky quality and a strutting groove that calls back to the immediacy of her debut. But where Laura was a fresh-faced teenager there, she wears and wields the decade past with a wistful, knowing smile. Um, yeah. The title track is one of the best songs Laura has yet released. Uh, again, one among the more spare on the record, but anchored by one of her most trenchant and captivating performances alongside a blossoming string arrangement that seems as though it's blooming from her voice itself. Uh, unsurprisingly, the best sounding track here in terms of music production and mixing is the one track which actually features contributions from Blake Mills, that being The End of the Affair, uh, which is a delicate and moving song about the impermanence of love that features the strange and haunting bedrock of cold ambience that somehow enhances the tragic edge of the song's wistful tone. It recalls classic era Fleetwood Mac, or perhaps obviously Joni Mitchell's Blue, while feeling still an extension of Laura's world specifically and anchored to her. The way she adjusts her vocal here to swell and sweep when she says, I love you, goodbye, but to recede gently for the patient assertion of now let me live my life is fucking devastating. Uh, the lilting ascend descend melody of hope we meet again initially grated me for some reason, but it has since clicked as a stark and grim reflection of the waves of optimism falling to pessimism and then back up again that the protagonist has for her life in the wake of the end of the relationship discussed in the previous track. In that way, these two tracks feel tied to me. Hope we meet again is like a sequel or a continuation of the end of the affair and it helps enhance the flow of the record, I think. Um, and, it, and also uh, those, these two songs next to each other give it with that context makes both of them feel even more gut wrenching. Um, For You is an understated conclusion with these gentle acoustic strums and baritone wordless hums that eases the record from its skyward dive through matters of the heart back down to earth for a gentle landing. Uh, yeah, I really can't impress on uh, you all enough how much this record's grown on me. Oh, and I wanted to shout out, I didn't write about it, but I did want to shout out Fortune since um, Sersha didn't really talk about it. I think that's a really great song as well. Uh, I, loved, I loved reading that the song was inspired by a revelation from Laura that she, of a time where she discovered that her mother had secretly been saving money in case she wanted to flee the family and start a new life. Um, and that's what uh, Fortune is about. And I found that was, and, out, and I didn't know that, but then I read that and I was like, oh yeah, it's immediately apparent in the lyrics that that's kind of what this sort of story it's hinting at. Um, and, and it really touches beautifully on this notion of uh, having everything, uh, but also feeling uncomfortable, uncertain, ang anxious. We landed on rocks and that's partly to blame. We wandered the landscape in this unbearable pain. Oh my, your fortune can change. Uh, it's, it's a beautifully, uh, it's a very sad and, and tragic song uh, that's just buried in the back half of this record. And, and it's a perfect example of like the sort of hidden gems. This thing's only 10 tracks. It's really tight. It's 36 minutes but yet it's absolutely packed with emotional, moving moments of, of, of classic songwriter stuff. Like, this is the kind of stuff that um, you need to live a bit to be able to write songs like these. And it's clear that Laura's at the stage now where she's reflecting on, she's 30 now, I think, or she's like, yeah, she's thir turned 30 the year this came out last year. So she has a whole decade of being an adult to reflect on as well as uh, her artistic career uh, and and it's a, this is a beautiful encapsulation I guess of where Laura seems to be at and it only makes me more excited for the future of, of her uh, songwriting like uh, this alongside Semper Femina feels like we're entering a golden era for her of, of, of writing and, I, and I'm absolutely thrilled to um, have come on this journey with Laura from a discography where I was initially held at a bit of a distance from the first record and, and not 
entirely convinced that Laura necessarily had what it took to be a great songwriter in my eyes, to having that assertion utterly bulldozed by the time I finished this and, 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 and having full confidence in her as one of the greatest um, doing it today. Uh, fantastic record. I'm so glad to hear that. Like the, that you had that journey, especially mm. makes me incredibly happy. Like I've not been secretive about the fact I've been nervous about doing this because Laura's so important to me, and yeah. she wasn't really on anyone's radar before we did this. I suppose. Um, yeah. Like I, I glad. put her forward for the bracket she did right at the start, but um. Yeah, and I'm glad that that we did this because um, I'm glad that it's given me a new appreciation for her and also just in general for how to approach um, more subtle and intricate folk singer songwriters like her who perhaps are need a little bit more attention and focus than most music than the way that most people approach music. Yeah, like I think it says a lot she's been nominated for the Mercury Prize four times and never won. Um, yes. in the yeah. She does music that a lot of people could agree is pretty good, but uh, it takes time to really connect with. Yeah, no, I agree totally. It leaves Jake. Yeah. Oh, I really hate to fucking. I, 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 this album's very, very good. I just really hate going last <laughs> on it because I am not as over the moon about it as you two, and I feel like I'm ending it on a downer note, and I hate that. Uh, let me just clear the air. The, the, the minimal approach to instrumentation is really the thing that held me at arm's length when I first heard this, and unfortunately that just really hasn't changed, is that some of these songs just feel just a bit too sparse, especially especially after I heard the rest of her discography. In, in some respects, I, I am glad that she went on this venture just to do this, but for me, it loses a lot of what makes her as an artist special, and it, like, I, and I hate that. I hate that it was that. It was not an obstacle that I was able to overcome. Um, that, that one song on here just really doesn't do anything for me. But the rest of the record um, it is fantastic. I, I think it's... Um, the, the, the level up in terms of writing um, on Semper Firmina was carried over here and even in some ways like better. I, I think Tyler put it best when he said this album's like 36 minutes long and yet it packs so much poignant emotional content into it. It's like fucking crazy. Um, and I just generally think that her, her writing has, has really never been better and that does make me very excited to see what uh, she takes on beyond this. Um, I love uh, the opener, Alexandra weaves a very compelling narrative about its lead character. Held Down um, has, is a great song, has these amazing vocal harmonies that permeate the end of the verse lines that sort of disappear in the final third of the song. And it really emphasizes the thematic core of the song, I, I feel. Like it's just sort of, you feel sort of an absence there that I feel like this is something that only someone as seasoned in terms of song structure could do uh, at this point in their career. Um, except instead of doing it with uh, building sonic uh, intricacies, it does it with taking away, uh, which is, again, very indicative of the album. Uh, there's, uh, I like the energetic and spirited strange girl. Um, I love the gentle, quiet guitar chords on my favorite. I'll say that this will bounce me back, I guess, in terms of positivity. My favorite Laura Marling song, which is Only the Strong. Um, I love... This, I love everything about this, and the fucking line, love is a sickness cured by time. Woo! Ah! Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, stop. You are, you're, you're adding me <laughs> so many times. I can only be added so much. And, she not only has her way with words, but like an understanding of what damaged people feel like. Um, she speaks to that part of me very deeply, and very deeply on this album, as I feel what makes this song so brilliant is that it feels like a letter to her past self about the hardship she'd endure, um, specifically with Heartbreak, but just in general, but it also feels like this is a microcosm of the album, is that several times on uh, Laura Marling's albums, she's confronted the idea of talking to a version of herself be it a version of herself that she is idolizing, a version of herself that is like she's aspiring to be, a version of her past self, 
And this feels like that idea expanded to the length of an album, which I think is a fan-fucking-tastic idea to build your album around. Like, that's, that's a, just a great thing that only Laura could do at this point in her career. Um, Blow by Blow is a fantastic song. It begins with these really, really elegant pianos, but it's, it's tasteful but varied, incredibly beautiful. Um, I do wish the song was just a little bit longer and a little bit more developed, though. Just, you know, tiny nitpick. Uh, song for Our Daughter is a wonderful song about the inherent pain of parenthood and seeing your child grow older. But, like, Sarah, that thing you said about the... <laughs> the tragedy of, of parenthood being that the advice and love that you put into parenting only existing for the span of a lifetime holy fuck that was really really poignant and that's that's exactly what this song is um it was beautifully said i i couldn't say it better than that um fortune uh, is one of my other favorite songs on here a lovely little tune about the unpredictability of life and having to adapt to it that has this tragic side to it of part of your life having to be like built up and built around you and you having like people who are important to you and then like this idea of you know saving up money to like go away from that because that's uh what you really wanted all along and it's just like that's a fucking tragic concept to think about um but it also really reminds me instrumentally and with even some of the vocal deliveries of the song savior complex off of punisher mm. um which i just thought was an interesting little parallel because those songs are really not far away from each other in terms of theme mm. um because they're all both about sort of escaping this this previous this life and but but the inherent tragedy of the escape um and, and i think that that's just it, it's very well captured here um the only song I'm really not in love with is The End of the Affair. It's just, it's, it's a bit minimal, and, and it's one of those songs that's like, I, that I just feel like has occurred throughout her discography in the sense of them being too uh, nondescript to the point where I don't have as much to latch oh. to. And I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with Tyler. I'm with, I'm with Tyler. I'm on sorry. This. It's just, it's, it's one of those many songs where it's like, it's one of the ones on the track list where I'm just like, I could feel this growing with upon, upon re-listen. It just hasn't gotten there yet. And it's, That's I, right. uh, I like know it's, exactly it, what that feels like, but also it's the end of the affair. Like it's, it's a good song that I just, I just don't get nearly as much as I do from the rest of the album. Um, that said, I think Hope We Meet Again is a phenomenal song. Um, it sees her sort of dwelling on her past and how it might affect even her future, which is something that hasn't really been brought up on the album until now, is the idea of, like, beyond this, because she's doing this from such a place of, a uh, of wisdom and, 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 um, like, using all the things that she's learned, the idea of her going forward herself is, um, uh, sort of not permeating your brain until this point. Um... For You is a closer about Laura holding what she holds dear close to her. It's a sunnier, more optimistic song that feels uh, thematically appropriate to end the record on. It's a very reminiscent of the closer of the last record in a lot of ways. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a great album. I just, I, I'm just not in love with it. And I really wish I was because you two had some very insightful and beautiful things to say about it. It could totally grow on me, but it's, it's just not in the upper echelons of, of her stuff for me. It's fine. Look, we can't all be right, you know? <laughs> That's some aggressive douchebag. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> sure. No, 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 because it, that was exactly how I was until this morning. So, like, these kinds of things, not that I'm suggesting it will necessarily, but I know you and I are both kind of aware of how, how precious these things are like uh, your feeling on something can just flip on a dime and you just never know whether it will or whether it won't um yeah. and you got to be honest about that and that's just life um yeah like i, I was very and, and i feel comfortable in my assessment because um, it is literally the one i have lived with for like months it's the only one that i heard and have heard many times since yeah so it's dope uh, it's a good album the album the album's good Good. Yeah. It's a good album. It's about good things. It's about good things like loving a family and uh, not 
fucking people you're not married to, although that is fine if you do that. I know from experience that that's okay. Okay. All Sarah's, right. Sarah's a notable divorcee. <laughs> All right. <laughs> On that note, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, what order do we want to go in there? Uh, Jake, you go first. Okay. Um, my three favorite songs are Fortune, Held Down, and Only the Strong. Uh, least favorite songs are fair, and I give the album a 7.5 out of 10. Um, okay. <laughs> My favorite tracks are Hell Down, Song for a Daughter, and For You. But I don't have a least favorite song, Fight Me. Um, and I'm going to give this record a 10 out of 10. Beautiful. Uh, my favorite songs are Hell Down, Song for Our Daughter, and The End of the Affair. My least favorite song, if I had to pick one, uh, oh boy, that's tough. I guess... <laughs> I really, really like this song a lot. So I, I guess I'd pick Blow by Blow, but I do really like that song. Um, and, and Jesus Christ, it's those fucking lines, lyrics that I said earlier from that song. Yeah. Uh... So, yeah, this album also gets, uh, I, no, not also because no one else has given it this rating. I was <laughs> thinking also because it's the same rating I gave the last one, which is a 9 right. out of 10. Okay. Yeah. I think 9 it's out of 10. Eight- an 8.8, which is in the company of Age of Ads, Ultra Visitor, Drinking Songs, and Shimi Battle to Pink Robots. Yeah. Again, you can't argue with that company. Good shit. All right. Well, now, as is custom, if we're all prepared, we do our um, album rankings and top 10 songs from this artist. Uh, I'm going to go first. Just going to kind of pick myself to go first oh, because I can. Do it. Live your best life. Uh, um, so my album ranking uh, in seventh place is short movie. Six, a creature I don't know. A five, alas, I cannot swim. Four, how is this only four? I speak because I can. Three, once I was an eagle. Two, song for a daughter. And one, semper femina. And my top ten Laura Marling songs. And I want to stress this is this top ten is incredibly tentative <laughs> because <laughs> I, I not just because she has so many great songs but just because I really just cobbled this together in the last five minutes before we started recording and I it, it could change so easily um but number 10 next time uh number nine once number eight nothing not nearly number seven the valley number six I was an eagle number five soothing Number four, Held Down. Number three, Goodbye England. Number two, Master Hunter. And my favorite Laura Marling song, I Speak Because I Can. Nice. All right, we'll leap on that. I was saying my number 10 is A Devil's Resting Place. Uh, number nine is Failure. Number eight is uh, Goodbye England Covered in Snow. Um, number seven is New Romantic. Number six is For You. Number five is Soothing. Number four, Master Hunter. Don't know why I've gone northern. Yeah, um, <laughs> Master. Master Hunter. Hunter. Number three is Ghosts. <laughs> number two is Song for a Daughter. And number one is uh, Nothing Not Nearly. Beautiful. And your album ranking, Sasha? My album ranking, uh, the lowest is uh, A Creature I Don't Know, and then short movie, Once I Was an Eagle, Alas, I Cannot Swim, Semper Femina, and Song for Our Daughter. Well, I did this as I was listening to all of them, so my ranking is pretty definitive, and I did 20 because I'm an asshole. Um, Do it. Uh, number 20, I have nothing, not nearly. 19... Goodbye, England. 18, What He Wrote. 17, Night After Night. 16, Soothing. 15, Fortune. 14, The Beast. 13, Little Love Caster. 12, Tap at My Window. 11, Old Stone. 10, Alpha Shallows. 9, Held Down. 8, Devil's Resting Place. 
7, my manic and I, 6, Noel, 5, your only doll, Dora, 4, the valley, 3, the captain in the hourglass, 2, hope in the air, and 1, only the strong. Nice. Ah. Oh. That what a sounds, good ranking. That's a Thank nice you. top five with lots of deep cuts. That's, yeah, I, I did my best, and my ranking is seven, a creature I don't know, six, short movie, five, song for our daughter, four, once I was an eagle, three, alas, I cannot swim, two, semper femina, and one, I speak because I can. That's also so bored, dude. Beautiful. We All right. Did well, it. Uh, to our viewers at home, please let us know what is your favorite Laura Marling e record? What are your favorite Laura Marling songs? What did you think of our opinions, takes? Did we miss anything crucial about these records that you want to shout out? Let us know in the comments below or hit us up on our Twitter, which is in the description. Uh, we would love to hear from you and we would love to hear what you think of our video. This was a lot of a lot of fun to do. I was terrified that I would have no meaningful contributions to give. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but I think that we all did a pretty damn good job without being yeah. uh, without any of us being redundant to another person. Mm. So uh, yeah, it was really good. Good fun. Our next B side is going to be coming uh, in about two weeks' time. Is going to be on Block Party. So stick around for that one. Obviously, we do new release reviews and. Uh, special record club reviews for classic records every single week so be sure to subscribe if you're not already and stick around for those um yeah anyone have anything they want to plug or say or add <laughs> um I, I here's the thing um if i just want to say this just because um there are some people who might just be here for the b-sides i don't know um and the next time i'll be here is in over a month doing a b-side um, so to say this right now, um, I have a record coming out on Yo. every fifth. Uh, you do. There is, yeah. Your uh, debut there, record, your debut I'm, LP. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so fucking excited to finally hear this thing. Yeah, it's called really. Panic Attacks in Public. Um, what a and, oh, That's great. Thank you. Um, I've had a few of those. What same. A um and there are four songs that need vocals and one song that needs some re-editing and then it's finished and it's coming out february 5th wonderful that's exciting stick around for that we're obviously going to be talking about that on our podcast as well but of course if you want more of all of us we, we again Sersha will be on Sersha's on our every day every week podcast so stick around for that um Rock over London, rock on Chicago, Reebok. Victoria's Secret, a body for everybody.